I think we are just about there. Uh, maybe we keep moving. Philip, you may take up the space. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kaudia. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Philip. Yeah, on behalf of the uh, coordinating partners, that is the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, African Union Commission, United Nations Environment Program, Regional Office for Africa, and the Stockholm Environment Institute. It's my pleasure now to welcome all of you distinguished delegates, uh, participants and colleagues to the inaugural virtual partnership forum for the integrated action on air pollution and climate change in Africa. Uh, during this session, uh, you will have the benefit of hearing um, from some of our uh, top leadership uh, across the four institutions as well as uh, some of the experts from different um, intergovernmental organizations, national governments, and uh, civil society organizations. My name is Philip Asano. I am the director, center director for the Stockholm Environment Institute, Africa Center, <clears throat> based in Nairobi. I will take you through uh, very quickly the um, objectives of this meeting and some background. Um, could I request that we all the slides. So the assessment um, has several benefits. As most of you might know, uh, the African Integrated Assessment on Air Pollution and Climate Change uh, is currently being finalized, but we have completed the, the summary for decision makers, which was launched at the Climate Corporate Seven in Egypt. Uh, some of the key highlights uh, from the summary for decision makers uh, is the fact that uh, the assessment identifies uh, five action areas, uh, and within those five action areas, a total of 37 uh, measures that if implemented um, in an integrated way would lead to the prevention of about 200,000 premature deaths by year by 2030, that is in time for the SDGs, and about 880,000 deaths by year by 2063, that's the time that we end the African Union Agenda 2063. Uh, in, there are also very uh, strong gains or benefits that might be realized through greenhouse gas emission reduction, uh, particularly reduction of carbon dioxide emissions by 55%, methane emissions by 74%, and nitrous oxide emissions by 40% by 2063. Um, <clears throat> and the gains and benefits uh, would be seen in food security, uh, more specifically the reduction um, on control of desertification um, and also increasing crop yields, more uh, in particular for rice, maize, soy, and wheat. And lastly, of course, um, uh, implementation of these measures would contribute to global efforts to uh, limit warming to the Paris uh, Agreement target of 1.5 degrees. Um, and at the same time, of course, limit also some negative effects on the regional climate change in Africa. Next slide. So the purpose of this meeting uh, is a fast partnership forum. Uh, we expect to have maybe uh, two others that might follow during this year, and is to create awareness, partnerships, and develop a roadmap for implementation of the 37 measures across the five key areas, which are transport, residential, energy, agriculture, and waste, uh, to fight climate change, uh, prevent air pollution, and protect human health and the environment simultaneously. Next slide. Uh, we have four aims for this meeting. The first one is to determine how to strengthen the existing community of practice as partnerships that would implement that seven measures across the five key areas. And this is in line with the African Ministerial Conference on Environment Decision 18, uh, stroke four mandate. Um, the partnership will support action by stakeholders at different scale, uh, subnational scale, national scale, and uh, regional scale, and continental scale. The second aim is to propose a roadmap to assist the African Union Commission to coordinate implementation of the proposed African Clean Air Program and the development of a continental scale cooperation framework linking to African Union Agenda 2063 priorities, the Sustainable Development Goals, the NDCs under the Paris Agreement and the resolutions of the United Nations Environment Assembly, of course, among others. Uh, the third aim is to document expression of interest, and this is very important, in supporting or being involved in the implementation of the measures in across the five key areas. 
based on respective country and regional policies, as well as sector policies. And lastly, of course, we hope to identify champion countries um, in each of the regional economic communities across Africa that would need implementation at, at regional scale. Next slide. So uh, we have two expected outputs. One is, of course, an African-wide community of practice on an integrated response to air pollution and climate change. Um, that these issues are conceptualized and a way forward for operationalization is determined. And the second one is to develop an outline for African Clean Air Program organizers uh, of the meeting. Next slide. Uh, so uh, just uh, as a reminder, the assessment identifies actions across five key areas. Um, and these five key areas are energy, uh, residential sector, waste, agriculture, and transport. And within each of those five areas, uh, you can see each of the measures that um, have been suggested uh, that have come out of the assessment recommendations. Next slide. Uh, we will later on hear from uh, the Secretariat of the African Ministerial Conference on Environment uh, via decision 18 stroke four. Um, the AMSEN noted the completion of the integrated assessment of air pollution and climate change for sustainable development in Africa and its report uh, in response to the AMSEN decision 17 stroke two, uh, which had African government, African countries to support further development and implementation of the that seven recommended measures as a continent-wide Africa clean air program, coordinated by strong country-led initiatives and cascaded to the regional economic communities and higher levels of policy. Next slide. Mm -hmm. So that's that's it uh, by way of background, aims, objectives. Uh, as we get into this first session, it's now my pleasure to introduce um, the four speakers that will be representing um, uh, the key coordinating partners. Uh, Climate and Clean Air Coalition, Stockholm Environment Institute, African Union Commission, and the United Nations Environment Program. So let me welcome Martina Otto, um, Head of Secretariat Climate and Clean Air Commissions, which is hosted by the United Nations Environment Program. Martina, over to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Philippe. Um, and uh, it's good to see all of you uh, on, on the screen here. A pleasure to be with you. And I would like to extend a very warm welcome to the session and thank uh, you all already for your engagement thus far in delivering uh, and spreading the word on the integrated assessment on air pollution and climate change for sustainable development in Africa. And let me just, and you've done, Philippe, you have done a fantastic job in, in giving us a, a, an overview of what's in it and uh, what we're set out to do. So let me just highlight briefly the partnership spirit in which this assessment has been delivered with the African Union Commission, the UNEP Africa Office, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, which I have the pleasure to represent, the, the work of the co-chairs, the many authors, the modelers, the reviewers, and all those who've provided inputs and uh, of course, SEI for the role in the essential role in accompanying this process um, so well from a technical perspective. And we, we look to the same partnership spirit in the implementation of the report findings, how to set up this process and, and help uh, roll it out. We proudly presented the results of this first ever integrated assessment of air pollution and climate change for the continent at the last session of AMSA, and you mentioned it, at the Climate COP26, and we'll have a few milestone events this year to further raise interest in and the, the profile of this report. And um, I think it's, it's important to highlight that the engagement of scientists from within the region was essential uh, in the development of the report and really builds a strong scientific backbone for the implementation going forward. And similarly, in the process, we were able to close some data gaps and supported the development, for example, of national inventories. And that will be another pillar, strong pillar in going forward. And we saw the political buy-in and the commitment, both with the rec recognition in AMSEN, um, but also the uh, strong engagement um, and leadership of the African Union Commission and the plan for a continent-wide air uh, clean air program. I think that's uh, a key ingredients for us to, to go forward. 
And I don't think I have to convince you uh, of the importance of what is on, on our agenda, but I, I really want to say air pollution is one of the greatest environmental threats to human health. The very fact that what keeps us alive, breathing, also makes us sick, makes it an imperative to act upon it. And obviously the numbers um, are, are out there in, in, in Africa, an estimated 1 million people per year die prematurely from um, air pollution. So it's really important to, to deal with, uh, with the topic. And the very fact that the air pollutants and greenhouse um, gases often um, share the same sources and drivers, including fossil fuel drift and economic growth, um, is that we have picked to work on the subset of so-called short-lived climate pollutants, which directly contribute to climate change and air pollution. Um, and reducing those will help us to put us on a 1.5 um, degree pathway and actually to say without it, it's it's pretty impossible to meet it. So it, it is really, really important also with a view on helping to limit the horrendous impact of climate change, particularly looking at the vulnerability uh, on, on this con continent. So really important to do this. Um, and obviously that goes back to the fact that uh, the short-lived climate pollutants have a global, higher global warming potential and a shorter lifetime in the atmosphere. And that helps us to deal with the concentrations um, uh, this decade and um, and really reduce the rate of warming. Now, with the report, we identified those 37 measures and uh, and uh, Philippe mentioned mm -hmm. it already. This is also a way to uh, really meet development uh, objectives. And uh, I think that is absolutely critical to embed it in, in this. Now, the beauty of those 37 measures is as well that nearly all those that have been recommended have been found in one way or the other, at least in one of the um, the, the countries, um, in in one of the African nationally determined contributions as well. So there's there's a there's something to build on as well as we as we go forward, and um, and I think uh, for the implementation it's important to say that we need all the hands on deck. So the scientists, the businesses, finance, non state actors, governments, development partners. And it's really about all of us joining forces to pull and pool resources to implement uh, oh. these, uh, to help implement these measures at the space uh, at the scale and at the pace that we need. And we've gathered um, in in this in this group now to define the next steps towards the implementation. And um, and I think it's really about strengthening these existing communities of practice uh, for the measures across the five sectors. Um, that, uh, that uh, is really important to look at. The report flagged also the importance of this Africa Clean Air Program. And we're very, very glad to team up with the African Union Commission uh, to propose also a roadmap to operationalize this um, all, to, all together. And uh, we hope to record expressions of interest to lead as champion countries and to provide support as well. So I think we have all the ingredients to move forward fast together. And uh, I very much look forward to the discussions today to kick us off on a, on a good track to make this happen. So with that, thank you very much. And thank you really for the really good partnership uh, that already has happened and brought us to the point at which we are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martina. Indeed, uh, we have all the ingredients for the price partnerships to take this recommendations forward. Um, let me thank you on behalf of the coordinating team uh, for the support that we have received very strongly from the Climate and Clean Air Commission, uh, and particularly from you as the head of the Secretariat. We hope and look forward to that continued support. Um, let me now move to the next speaker, um, Professor Mons Nielsen, the Executive Director, Stockholm Environment Institute. Mons, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, good to see you all, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so at SEI, our overall work is to connect science, policy, and decision-making to develop solutions for a sustainable future. We use research as our tool and build capacity, strengthen institutions, and equip partners for the long-term change, making scientific knowledge and tools accessible to decision-makers and support a variety of partners, including governments, intergovernmental agencies and civil society to make informed decisions. So we're really happy to co-host this inaugural partnership forum together with the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, Africa Union Commission, and UNEP Regional Office for Africa. 
Why is SEI involved here? Well, African continent has been a priority for SEI for a long time. And we currently have projects and engagements in more than 30 countries. We opened our Africa Center in 2008 and have been located in Nairobi since 2012. The Africa Center of SEI is working on energy, bioeconomy, blue economy, pollution waste, climate adaptation, and urban sustainability. But our Africa work goes well beyond this with specialist research from our centers around the world feeding in. So the work of today is a case in point. We're combining our African specialists with colleagues in the US that have world leading energy and emissions modeling expertise and in the UK on air pollution and climate modeling and mitigation. And SEI has had historical engagement on air pollution issues going back 25 years to a time when Swedish Development Corporation was funding regional air pollution in developing countries program. And it led to an information network called APINA and then the Harara Declaration in 1998 and the Lusaka Agreement in 2008 on regional cooperation for action on air pollution in Africa. Um, and later came a program called GAP Forum, Global Atmospheric Pollution, that helped us develop regional agreements in East and West Africa and pioneer the work on integrated air pollution and climate change co-benefits, which is what underpins the Africa assessment that we're here to discuss today. So we've been also leading regional assessments on climate and clean air coalition in Latin America and Asia Pacific. And we use that experience to help coordinate the Africa assessment. And in all this work, partnerships with the regional scientists, the UNEP Regional Office for Africa, and the regional economic communities has been crucial. And we're happy to see these partnerships gaining strength through the Africa assessment with the African Union, the UNEP, ROA, CCAC, and SCI working closely together to make this a success. And the process has been backed by over 100 scientists, practitioners, advisors, mostly from Africa, but also some international experts. And I think this is an achievement in itself to celebrate. And with, we have 100 people on this event today, which really shows this sense of a growing community of practice. Um, and we've used the SEI low emissions analysis platform called LEAP um, for energy planning in, the, in most African countries. And for this assessment, we have extended that tool beyond the energy sector to also include emissions from agriculture and waste. And together with CCAC, we've been able to help 17 countries in Africa to develop their uh, mitigation planning, including short-lived climate pollutant strategies, air quality strategies, and to support countries to develop their NDCs. Uh, for example, in Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, Eswatini and Zimbabwe and they're reporting to the UNFCCC. So the Africa assessment with the LEAP tool is used to develop the integrated mitigation scenarios, which includes both engagement with modelers and the assessment authors to make sure that the data and the modeling is appropriate for how Africa might develop into the future. LEAP was used uh, to develop an open source emissions inventory for every country in Africa. So note here that this database is free now for countries to use and SEI stands ready to provide further technical support to help governments and the supporting agencies to develop their own analysis as the process moves forward. And integrated actions to implement the 37 solutions that we have identified in the assessment will enable African countries to achieve low emissions development pathways and realize the goals of the Agenda 2063. We'll continue at SEI to strengthen these partnerships and support national governments to implement these measures and extend these partnerships, especially to actors in civil society and private sector that helps us bridge the gap between science policy and practice. So we can now, shifts the focus 
continue with analysis, but also for implementation and action. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Mons, for those inspiring words. Um, and again, on behalf of the assessment team, let me just express our appreciation to the support received from uh, the Stockholm Environment Institute and uh, also from yourself as, as the executive director. And I just wanted to emphasize the one word that I think has come out strongly, the need to bridge the gap between science, policy, and practice. I think we, 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 we view that the, the engagement with the practitioner was very essential to us ensuring the implementation. Uh, colleagues, let me request those that are not speaking to mute yourself, please. Uh, a colleague called Flori, kindly mute yourself. Thank you. Okay, let me move to our next speaker. Um, I would like to check if uh, Dr. Hassan Nyambe from the African Union Commission um, is online. Kevin, do we know if Dr. Nyambe is online already? Um, I can't see him, but uh, Caroline, is Caroline there? Okay, as we check on Dr. Nyambe, then I think I would like to um, invite Dr. Richard Munang from the United Nations uh, Environment Program Regional Office for Africa, uh, representing the director and regional representative, uh, Dr. Frank Tureachunga. So uh, Dr. Munang, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Philip, and I stand on the already established protocols that have been set. Um, just imagine seeing your dream phone on display on a day you are shopping for a phone, but realizing that the price is beyond your reach. But as you turn to go, the attendant tells you he has a cheaper offer, only that it has a broken screen with no guarantees that it would work after repairs. Would you buy it? Your guess is as good as mine. Yet most of us seem oblivious of a greater compounded risk scenario of climate change and pollution. Air pollutants that we've already heard and greenhouse emissions often shared sources and are more dangerous when combined, but our basic actions seem oblivious. Consider this, Africa is the least emitter of greenhouse gases globally responsible for only two to 3% of global emissions. Yet, up to 70% of the continent's population is dependent on wood and their prim as the primary source of fuel, a scenario that is killing between 490,000 to nearly 700,000 Africans every year, while depleting forests to become the top driver of tropical forest laws and emissions. The continent is also the largest importer of used vehicles most of which would not be allowed to circulate on the routes of exporting countries because of their high emissions. This scenario has led to a 7% growth in annual transport emissions on the continent. Cumulatively, as we're speaking today, every year pollution costs us over 400,000 billion while climate change reduces the productive output of each and every African by five to 15%. These losses stifle the continent's progress in realizing the sustainable development goals. And what is worse is that without urgent action, the cause of air pollution in the continent cities is set to increase by up to 600% by 2040. So what do we need to do? Distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is in addressing this compounded risk that we gather today. Our Senate is well armed with positive policy signals on willingness to act as we've already heard indicated by Africa's impressive ratification of the nationally determined contributions that prioritize action in key polluting sectors. The continent is well armed with commitment to take action to combat methane short-lived climate pollutants and black carbon among key air polluting sources that Climate Clean Air Coalition has been leading with partners. These are well expressed in high level policy positions that the continent has aligned with be it the African Union Agenda 2063, AMSEN, the SDGs and Agenda 2030, UNIA resolutions and national level steps where 19 countries have legally enforceable ambient air quality standards. 
This is, however, only about 35% compliant compared to 63% global average, and a lot remains to be done. And since we know that what gets major get done, we now have the integrated assessment of air pollution and climate change for Africa's sustainable development before us. Its analysis lays the integrated and compounded risk posed by air pollution and climate change towards the realization of the sustainable development goals and the opportunities and the gaps to be filled towards surmounting this risk and enhancing the realization of the SDGs. At the heart of this assessment is the implementation of 37 measures across five key areas, transport, residential, energy, energy, agriculture, and waste to fight climate change, to prevent air pollution and protect human health and the environment. Simultaneously, these can be achieved and these align with the United Nations Environment Program, MTS, and now we can implement them, leveraging on everyone's ability. And now I'll leave you with some points that I think are needed for the implementation. The first is that we must prioritize the low-hanging fruits. In each of the five areas, there are some accessible measures that a continent can start off to build on ready successes within countries and across the entire continent. For example, in transport, the measure of cleaner existing transport is one that has continued to see countries achieve success with fuel and vehicular emission standards. We need to prioritize cross learnings where successes in countries and regions are transplanted to become the norm and not the exception. And at the same time, e-vehicles, which portend significant future investment opportunities for the continent, are yet another area where we see some countries formulating e-vehicle standards and relevant infrastructure development, including innovative aspects like greening, the off-grid for charging infrastructure. Beyond transport, under residential energy, clean cooking is a key area that is unlocking very accessible opportunities through waste recovery to clean cooking, which is creating accessible enterprises, including for young people in the continent. For instance, when we substitute charcoal with fuel briquettes, this presents an opportunity to tap into an over 20 billion year enterprise opportunities in the continent. And we see opportunities being unlocked through UNEP's work in the region. The second aspect that needs to be taken into consideration is we must premise these 37 actions as investment opportunity and diverse from the narrative that premises environmental action as a social action alone and start premising it as an investment opportunity. For example, investing in solar power projects in Africa has been shown to generate between 10 to 30% in annual returns while mitigating emissions and pollution sources. Such opportunities need to be projected through the translation of climate actions that combat pollution as stipulated in the NDCs into investment plans, a clear elucidation of financial returns on investments that can accrue to any actor, informal, formal, individual, institutional who implement the 37 measures need to be done in the form of investment plans for each of the 37 measures. And that takes me to the third point, which is we must leverage on innovative financing to cover financing gap. An investment plan is not complete without a clear financing strategy. Currently, as we speak today, only 14% of Africa's climate finance comes from the private sector, which is the lowest of any region in the world. Increasing the share of these private sources is an urgent need and calls for embracing of innovative financing solutions. Among the most promising are risk sharing facilities. Unlocking private sector sources call for a need to de-risk financing of climate action enterprise solutions that address pollution. Credit guarantee schemes from government to cover private sector lenders against default risk when financing climate action is a critical de-risking strategy that should be leveraged to accompany any established investment facility. The fourth is to tap into the youth and the informal sector. Up to 80% of the continent's working population is engaged in the informal sector, and over 60% of them are youthful. And I think we've argued this over and over again. You can only be able to leverage on your strength to drive transformational climate action and pollution actions in the continent. Africa's strength is her youth. Africa's strength is her youth and leveraging on the abilities becomes the implementation strategy of leveraging these 37 measures that are most accessible, such as clean cooking. And two of the most critical incentives that can be put in place are skills retooling for these young people to enable them to be able to learn the skills to require 
the skilled personnel to engage in enterprises aligned to the measures and affordable financing, which can be realized through the de-risking tools. The fifth is policy harmonization. Implementing the 37 measures through an enterprising lens require coherent actions cutting across diverse sectors. On agriculture, one of the actions in this search is improved manual management, which is critical to controlling methane emissions. However, such actions also contribute to waste, where biogas from compost is prioritized and to avoid overlaps in investments, actions in such complementarity will need to be harmonized, such that investments in biodigesters to manage waste also target the agricultural sector to recover agricultural waste and clean cooking to ensure biogas supply to close the clean energy, clean cooking gap. And this calls for coherent policy incentives across these complementary measures and areas. As we face this monumental challenge of climate change and pollution, it can feel like we are standing in front of a giant wave ready to knock us down. But we are not alone in this struggle. Like a supportive circle of friends, we must stand together and lift each other up as we take action. We have 37 measures before us today. And they set us not only as tools, they are like keys that can unlock a brighter future for all. So let's harness our collective strength, our institutional strengths, and draw back our bows to aim for that better tomorrow. Together, we can create a healthier and more sustainable world for everyone. Thank you. And have a great discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mulan, and uh, for your very inspiring words. Uh, please also express our appreciation to Dr. Kudia Tung and uh, the UNEP Regional uh, Office. I'm informed that uh, Dr. Nyambe is still unable to join uh, because there's actually an African Union Summit going on, so I think he's still held up. If he joins along the way, we will have him uh, give some remarks. In the meantime, let me hand over to our coordinating co-chair, Dr. Alice Kaudia, to take us through the next session. Dr. Kaudia. Thank you very much, uh, Philip, and uh, thank you so much for moderating that session. Welcome to all of us. I think uh, one of our team members said we should share the program online for some time. Uh, Kevin, do you have it? We could uh, just have a look where we are in the next uh, segment of this meeting. I must say it is very exciting that uh, we are all here. Kindly just enlarge it a little bit, Kevin. And uh, we are now in the second segment and uh, reading from listening to the uh, policy level opening remarks, we, we pick a few key words which come and these are partnerships because we already have partnerships on uh, air quality across Africa, as Man said um, 10 years ago, with the support from Stockholm Environment Institute. Uh, air quality agreements were developed for the Sadak region, uh, Eastern Africa region, Western Africa region, the Maghreb, and all these are in place. But uh, at the time, the focus was really on uh, preventing atmospheric air pollution uh, to help us have healthy environment, healthy people. But the climate lens was not in place. Uh, uh, at the moment, uh, I would say starting with the, the Paris Agreement being in place and the NDCs in place, there has been a stronger uh, focus on the air pollution climate change nexus. And I think the Africa Integrated Assessment on Air Pollution and Climate Change has actually grounded the science uh, on the links between air pollution and climate change. So moving forward in this segment, what do we want to do? We want to uh, learn lessons from various experiences on how we can work together in partnerships to tackle air pollution and climate change in Africa. And to begin with, uh, we are very delighted to have been joined by David Ombisi of the Secretariat of African Ministerial Conference on Environment. And uh, David will take us through the experience of AMSEN and we'll draw some lessons from that on partnerships. Remember, we are working on partnerships and the lessons that are there to inform how we can move forward uh, in developing the Africa Clean Air Program. Uh, 
kindly, uh, David, take the floor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alisa. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, colleagues and uh, all the distinguished guests who have uh, spoken before me. Um, my name is David Ombisi, as uh, you've been told. Um, I'm the coordinator of um, the AMSEN Secretariat, which is based at uh, UNEP's Regional Office for Africa. Uh, for those who are new to this, uh, AMSEN is the African Ministerial Conference on Environment. And uh, this has been in existence uh, uh, for the last 38 years, uh, since 1985, uh, basically to promote regional cooperation uh, in addressing environmental issues uh, that continue to confront uh, the African region. Um, so I'll start maybe just two minutes to give a little background in terms of um, you know what AMSEN is and the role of AMSEN, and then of course go into uh, a little more with regard to um, uh, decisions that have been made by AMSEN uh, that um, impact on issues related to integrated um, assessment. Now, um, as I mentioned, AMSEN uh, meets regularly. Um, we have regular sessions of AMSEN that are held every two to three years. Um, but in addition to that, there are other uh, special sessions that are convened uh, to consider specific issues of interest uh, or of concern to the region. AMSEN works very closely with the African Union uh, through the Commission uh, for Rural Economy, Agriculture, Blue Economy, and Sustainable Environment. As I mentioned already, uh, the Secretariat is based at uh, UNEP's uh, Regional Office for Africa in Nairobi here. And uh, UNEP uh, being Secretariat provides uh, both technical and financial support uh, to the operations uh, of AMSEN. Of course, uh, the member states uh, do also contribute uh, to the AMSEN Trust Fund, uh, which uh, is um, used to facilitate uh, the implementation of the AMSEN decisions and uh, other AMSEN activities. Um, in terms of the running of um, AMSEN itself, it has a president uh, and uh, four bureau members. Uh, currently, the presidency is with the Senegal, and we have uh, four bureau members from Mauritania, from uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, Sudan, and Botswana. And these are elected at every regular session of AMSEN. It's on a rotational basis. So every two years, we get a new bureau and new um, that's the president and uh, vice president. Uh, quickly, in terms of the role of AMSEN, as um, in, in addition to uh, promoting, you know, um, uh, collaboration among African countries, it does provide leadership by promoting awareness and uh, consensus on uh, both regional and global environmental issues. Um, AMSEN also sort of supports uh, or provides a platform for member states uh, from the African region to develop common positions uh, that guide African representatives, uh, particularly in global negotiations uh, related to legally binding uh, environmental agreements. In addition to that, um, uh, AMSEN also supports African uh, countries' participation in international dialogue on various global issues of importance to Africa, uh, for example, the United Nations Environment Assembly, where um, you know uh, the engagement of Africa um, uh, is undertaken under the leadership of um, uh, the AMSEN presidency. In addition to that, we have uh, a number of activities and um, uh, policy and uh, strategic uh, issues uh, that are, are led by AMSEN uh, for the benefit of, um, of the continent. Now, I wanted to touch a little bit um, in terms of um, some of the previous AMSEN decisions, uh, particularly as they relate to the issue of um, integrated assessment, um, uh, particularly with regard to pollution and climate change. Um, uh, and I'll go as back as probably 10 years uh, back um, during the 14th session of AMSEN in 2012, uh, through decision 14 slash five, where AMSEN agreed uh, to support capacity building of African countries uh, in thematic and integrated environmental assessment and reporting. 
Uh, later on, um, that was uh, three years later in 2015 at the 15th session of AMSEN, which uh, took place in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, again, AMSEN agreed to enhance air quality monitoring and modeling, and also to develop uh, an Africa-wide air quality framework agreement on air quality management. Uh, during the same session, uh, AMSEN also agreed to enhance air quality management in Africa uh, particularly in the areas of policies, legislation, institutional framework, uh, management systems, public awareness, capacity building, and networking. And finally, during the same session uh, in 2015, uh, AMSEN requested UNEP, uh, of course, with other partners uh, to support the capacity building of African countries uh, in thematic and integrated environmental assessment and reporting. Later on, um, at the 16th uh, session, which took place in 2017 in Libreville, uh, Gabon, um, uh, uh, the ministers committed to improving uh, management of air, both indoor and outdoor, and of course, also the control of other forms of pollution uh, through the strengthening of knowledge management, which of course also uh, includes um, uh, assessments. They did commit to strengthening uh, the management of pollution aspects, uh, internalizing pollution costs and creating awareness, as well as improving management of persistent organic pollutants. More importantly, at uh, the 17th session in 2019, and uh, basically which laid the foundation uh, to um, uh, this particular uh, forum and uh, partnership that uh, we are gathered here today, AMSEN emphasized the benefits of improving air quality, including managing as appropriate uh, and reducing short-lived climate pollutants uh, in the environment. Um, at that session in uh, Durban, uh, AMSEN noted the need for an assessment of linkages between policies uh, to address air pollution and policies to address uh, climate change. As has already been uh, stated by uh, Philip and uh, Martina as well, um, at the resumed 18th session of AMSEN, which was uh, uh, held in Dakar uh, last September, uh, we launched the report on integrated assessment of air pollution and climate change uh, for sustainable development in Africa which of course was a response to the AMSEN decision 17-2 uh, that had been adopted in 2019 in, in, in Durban. Now the AMSEN meeting in Dakar and noted the findings of the report um, on the integrated assessment of air pollution climate change. And as has been mentioned by my colleague Richard as well, um, this report uh, urged countries to support uh, the development and implementation of 37 uh, recommended measures as a cont continent-wide Africa Clean Air Program, uh, of course, coordinated with uh, strong country-led uh, initiatives. So this um, gives you a background in terms of um, uh, previous uh, arms and decisions uh, that are related to um, air pollution and climate change. Of course, there are those other decisions that are specific to climate change, including NDCs and so forth, uh, which uh, I wouldn't want to go into uh, for the benefit of time, but also trying to focus uh, to our uh, objectives for this meeting today. Now, uh, moving forward, uh, one of the things that was noted by AMSEN, looking at the decisions that were made previously, and uh, uh, specifically the decisions that were made during the 17th session and 18th session, it was noted that um, the continent and African countries in specific continue to face um, uh, difficulties or constraints in implementing the decisions of AMSEN. And therefore, the ministers agreed that there was a need to take action to accelerate uh, implementation of uh, past and uh, uh, current arms and decisions. Uh, of course, uh, as uh, part of those measures in Dakar, uh, AMSEN agreed to collaborate now with the Conference of African Ministers of Finance, uh, Planning and Economic Development in forging collective efforts 
and, and actions. In addition to that, uh, the ministers agreed to the establishment of the Forum of en Environment Protection Agencies in Africa, which would help in terms of sharing experiences, sharing knowledge, uh, sharing best practices, and be able to advance uh, the implementation of arms and decisions. As I've mentioned, uh, this had been noted to be a challenge. Uh, whereby there are so many decisions that had been taken by AMSEN previously, but most of them were not fully uh, implemented. So in addition to that, um, uh, and in Dhaka, um, the ministers um, agreed to, you know, or call upon the United Cities and local governments of Africa and other stakeholders to be part and uh, contribute to the implementation of AMSEN uh, decisions. Um, in that vein as well, um, it was noted that uh, environmental issues are too large to be addressed by any single entity, but rather required concerted efforts by all sectors. As you'll see from the implementation of this particular uh, decision on integrated uh, assessment on air pollution and climate change, it's now bringing together uh, various um, uh, stakeholders, partners, institutions, uh, to be able to contribute to the implementation of this particular uh, initiative. And therefore, um, it was noted again by AMSEN that um, AMSEN decisions require enhancing partnerships. And I believe that uh, this is part of what we'll be discussing here today uh, at both national and regional levels and including with local authorities, with development partners, with the private sector and all other relevant uh, institutions. Now, when you look back, and this is maybe something for, for us to ponder as we move forward uh, in the implementation of this particular initiative, most of the member states uh, do need support uh, in terms of implementation of arms and decisions, particularly um, areas of those decisions where uh, responsibilities have been placed on the member states you realize that most of the member states do not have the capacity uh, on their own to be able to, to do that. And therefore they look forward or they look up to uh, different partners and stakeholders to come in and support uh, the implementation of these particular uh, decisions. There's also need to support um, now that uh, we'll be having the Forum of Environment Protection Agencies uh, which of course play a critical role in ensuring the monitoring, the enforcement, the com compliance of national, regional, global environmental commitments uh, as appropriate. And they do require support in terms of building their capacity to be able to um, undertake uh, uh, these responsibilities at the national level. And um, I'm pleased also to share with you that uh, we'll be having the first meeting of um, uh, the Forum of Environment Protection Agencies on the 7th and 8th of uh, March in Kigali, uh, Rwanda, where we are going to bring together the heads of these um, uh, EPAs uh, to be able to start uh, engaging among themselves and also sharing some of the challenges and difficulties uh, that they con continue to encounter uh, in the course of their work, particularly with uh, uh, monitoring, enforcement, and uh, implementation of the various uh, uh, commitments. And of course, we'll be looking to different partners to be able to come in and support uh, these EPAs in uh, their mandate. Um, we also need to support member states and the EPAs, of course, to promote the interpretation and utilization of scientific data and information. As you all realize, I mean, we do have, uh, for example, the report and the assessment, but when it comes to uh, being able to, or at the national level for these, uh, or the outcomes of these assessments, uh, the interpretation of the outcomes of these assessments, I think there is need to support the member states and uh, uh, those authorities uh, that do work on them to be able to understand uh, what the data means and how they can use that information, uh, particularly for policy making and other decision making, as well as um, planning for the development of their member states. 
So in conclusion, um, just sharing in terms of um, how we move forward, particularly from the um, AMSEN uh, perspective, and particularly with regard to reporting now uh, back on the various decisions. Um, uh, for the last two AMSEN sessions, uh, the ministers or AMSEN committed to taking measures to make sure that we are able to evaluate uh, progress uh, in the implementation of um, the AMSEN decisions and of course also taking into consideration any other emerging issues that would need to be brought uh, to the attention of the ministers. And therefore, um, as a secretariat, we are working with the various stakeholders um, on the follow-up uh, of the various uh, decisions that have been um, adopted by AMSEN. Uh, and of course, I'm pleased to see that uh, one of such a follow-up is through this forum that we are having today. Uh, particularly with the regard to the uh, decision on integrated um, uh, assessment of air pollution and climate change, of course, which will then uh, be reporting back to AMSEN uh, in terms of its uh, progress and implementation. And part of that reporting also we do to the AMSEN through the AMSEN Bureau meetings, being able to uh, report back to the Bureau in terms of the progress. And of course, also highlighting any challenges that uh, might um, uh, be encountered along the way, uh, such that the Bureau can then give direction in terms of how uh, we can improve on the implementation of the various uh, decisions. Um, we also do share um, this information uh, by way of reporting to the African Union through the Specialized Technical Committee on Agriculture, Rural Development, Water and Environment, uh, which of course then is also taken uh, uh, through the uh, institutional structures of the African Union up to the African Union Summit. And of course, where, uh, where necessary getting endorsement from uh, the African uh, heads of state at the summit. We also, in terms of uh, reporting and tracking, uh, share information, particularly with African Diplomatic Corps in Nairobi, that's the ambassadors representing the various African uh, member states in Nairobi, as well as those who are based in Addis Ababa, uh, just to make sure that they are up to speed with regard to where we stand. Uh, on the implementation of the various arms and decisions. And final, of course, the main one is reporting back to arms and during uh, the regular session uh, when we report on uh, implementation of the various decisions, as well as highlighting any other relevant activities that might have taken a place in the context of uh, implementing those decisions. So that's uh, the, the mode of uh, or modus operandi in terms of how we handle um, the, the AMSEN decisions, uh, particularly with regard to the implementation and reporting back uh, to the various uh, uh, structures as well as uh, to the member states uh, uh, with regard to where we stand. As I mentioned, of course, um, implementation uh, was identified as a major constraint uh, in terms of uh, the decisions. And we are looking forward to working with all the partners and relevant uh, stakeholders to make sure that uh, there's uh, an improvement in terms of um, not only just uh, adopting uh, decisions, but making sure that they are fully implemented to the benefit of the region. So I think I'll stop there. And uh, perhaps if there is, uh, any question or clarification that uh, you might require me to come back to, then I can do that uh, uh, shortly because I have to check out into another meeting, unfortunately. So thank you and back to you, Alice. Thank you, David. Uh, that is great. Thank you for sharing with us the long history of efforts by African uh, ministers to tackle the challenges of uh, air pollution, initially with the lens on uh, environment health, but more increasingly as per decision 18 for uh, strengthening focus on air pollution and particularly reduction of uh, short-lived climate pollutants. Now, the, you have illustrated to us how it's important to have structures for reporting, monitoring and reporting and evaluating performance. And we are very glad that at this inaugural uh, meeting, 
we are all going to work towards uh, working together and seeing that the decision is implemented. Having said that, we know that uh, you are tight with the time, so I'm encouraging members on the in the house to just keep their questions and comments in the chat so that we can pick as much as possible and then we can uh, get uh, uh, David to address them before he leaves us. And uh, as as you do that, and in the interest of time, we would wish also to invite uh, Mr. David Indasi of Seaport 40 Cities. As you know, in Africa, we are an increasingly urbanizing continent. And with that comes the challenge of scarcity of natural resources that uh, support human life and uh, pollution that also occurs concurrently. So, uh, Victor, Please, you're welcome to uh, share you, with us you. your experience from the safety perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. As you've heard from Madam Chair, I'm Victor Ndasi. And I'm here today representing our regional director of Africa, Mr. Hastings, who could not be here because of other work commitments. So allow me to share my screen, please. Yeah, so for starters, C40 is a network of mayors of nearly 100 uh, world leading cities collaborating to address the issues of climate change. And in Africa, this uh, network of mayors is made up of around 13 mayors spread across West, South, and East Africa. In West Africa, it's a network of five cities. I'll be talking about more about those cities in a few. And then in South Africa, it's a network of five cities together three cities from East Africa, making it 13 cities in Africa. So I'll be giving our experiences working in those cities to address air pollution issues and also climate change. But uh, for this particular presentation, I'll be dwelling more on air pollution. But just to mention that C40 does run also a lot of uh, climate change uh, initiatives in these cities. Also, I also want to mention that uh, I'm not alone on this call from C40. I have two of my colleagues, uh, Simon and Tibebu. So if you have any questions while I'm talking, please just put in chat and they'll be addressed uh, as I continue uh, presenting. Thank you. So yeah, the reason why we address air pollution, obviously we are guided by our uh, air pollution, air, air quality goal, which is supporting cities to reduce impacts of health and climate to meet uh, WHO guidelines and also uh, meet the commitments addressed in the Paris Agreement. So to do so, we run our programs uh, based on three themes. One is increasing access to data sets. The second theme is also uh, evidencing these data sets so that we have uh, evidence-based uh, policies and policy making. And the third is supporting mayoral leadership to set ambitious goals to address both air pollution and climate change in these cities. So to do so, what uh, we run is, first of all, um, a commitment program, which this city is signed to. And uh, these commitments are intended to address various aspects of uh, air pollution, mainly for this presentation, but also climate change. And some of these uh, ambitious commitments include establishing baselines in those cities, and then also uh, creating new policies that address uh, pollution and making also data and uh, policies publicly available to show progress, both in uh, addressing rising pollution levels and also policies that are uh, enacted to uh, address those pollution concerns. So these are voluntary membership and uh, cities do commit themselves to these commitments voluntarily. So I'll quickly talk more about uh, the program that we are running currently. Uh, so this is shifting gears to a solution space. It's a program called uh, African Cities for Clean Air. It's a three-year program that uh, started last year and going on to next year. And this program is uh, anchored on to, uh, four goals. One of them is uh, addressing the data needs within the cities to address the data gaps 
And then uh, we also have, uh, we, we also do work on um, policies. So to identify or create evidence, data evidence policies across Africa to address uh, both uh, air pollution and climate change, knowing that those two are like uh, conjoined twins that cannot be separated. So approach is based on uh, three, five uh, stages. First of all is to connect cities so that um, cities that are advanced can share their experiences with cities that are not uh, so advanced. And then uh, capacity building and uh, to do this, there is uh, what you call taking persistent programs to address various uh, air pollution concerns within these cities. And how we do that is the cities identify priority areas that they wish to be addressed. And then through the program, we provide technical assistance that also builds uh, uh, awareness around air, uh, air pollution or air quality. And with these four, the goal is to inspire mayors to take bold actions to address both pollution and climate change. So in terms of progress uh, for this particular program, the program runs in five cities, but the bigger air quality program runs in 11 of the 13 cities. And this has to do with the an issue that I already mentioned at the start where cities voluntarily commit themselves to those uh, various targets. So cities that don't commit themselves obviously are not forced to, and so they're not included in the program. So these uh, 11 cities that we're currently working on, uh, five are in West Africa, two in East Africa, and three in, uh, four in Southern Africa. So out of those 11 cities, five of them, we are currently rolling out what you're calling technical assistance program. And that's in Dakar, Lagos, Addis Ababa, Johannesburg, and Durban. And I'll be talking more to that in my next slides. And also to address the issue of capacity, the program has uh, regional technical advisors that work closely with these cities to identify these uh, priority areas and also scope for uh, solutions to address those priority areas that are identified in these cities. So just to mention that in the five cities that I mentioned, cities identified various uh, pressing goals or pressing needs that they thought the program could help address or they could uh, use the program to try and uh, create solutions. Some of these are active uh, programs and some of them we have not initiated. So I'll quickly give examples for interest of those who are here and they would wish to collaborate with C40 to address some of this. So we have active uh, uh, calls for proposals, RFPs, requests for proposals in uh, four of the five cities. So in Lagos, obviously the city identified the data as an issue and there we are running a program to increase the uh, data monitoring network and also develop pollution and uh, health uh, inventories, data inventories. In Addis Ababa, there's a program to develop uh, building energy efficiency code. And then in uh, Johannesburg, we'll be running a program to develop the first ever low emission zone in Africa. And then in Durban, it's a policy to ban use dirty fuels in the city. And then in Dakar, which is coming soon, it's a uh, a program to develop their first ever city specific data air quality data management plan. So anybody on call who would wish to partner with us to address some of this, the calls are open and they are uh, open to anyone. Uh, we are not restricted by geographical locations, so anybody can partner with us as we try to address some of these challenges that have been identified by the cities. And as I summarize, you cannot separate climate and pollution. So we need to address air pollution and climate change as connected issues that cannot be separated. And we need swift and unprecedented and collaborative action to be able to address the sources of pollution that are harmful to our health and warming our planet. With that, I thank you. And uh, if time allows, Madam Chair can take a question, but if it doesn't, then we'll be addressing some of those in chat. Thank you so much. You are muted, sorry.
still muted? Alice, are you there? Okay. Philip? We can't hear you, Alice. <laughs> Yeah, there you are. Can you hear me? Yes, you're back. Ah, okay. I think it was just a microphone. Uh, but I was just saying thank you to Victor for sharing that uh, experience of C40 cities with us. And uh, as we have said, if there are any questions, please, uh, you we can uh, take them on the chat just uh, because of interest of time. But Victor, we do plead that uh, you be with us to the end of the program so that uh, if we have questions at the end, we can still address them to you. We are also uh, uh, in, informing the participants that uh, any comments, any questions you put in the chat, if we can't address them in this forum, this is just an inaugural forum and we'll continue with this conversation. We are already a community of practice here. So we move on, uh, even as we wait for the questions. We know that uh, in Africa, I think has been, as was presented during the opening session. And when you take the presentation from uh, uh, David Ombisi of the AMSEN Secretariat, the regional economic communities of Africa have had this air quality agreements uh, from way back 10 years ago, 2008 and, and so on. But uh, we experience shows that uh, we have had a rather this small or limited uh, application or uh, action on these air quality agreements. And here in this session, we are briefly going to share in a very, very open way. And this is now open to even participants to put their uh, voice on as to how can we um, move on to strengthen these regional programs in particular to infuse the lens of climate change and uh, uh, be able to have clean air for Africa. We also note that unlike the climate change uh, challenge that we have globally, that has got a global target agreed upon, that is the 1.5 degrees target with very, very clear earmarked years, you know, by 2030, we are supposed to do this, by 2050, we should be at zero emissions or something like that. We do not have a similar target on, uh, 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 on, 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 on partnerships or actions which are specifically looking at air quality, uh, air pollution and climate change in the nexus. So the question we have to ourselves, and this is open to all of us during this session, is how do we move forward? Uh, for example, can the regional agreements that we have be the anchor points for the initiative that we are trying to create uh, through this process for Africa to have clean air? Or do we think that as scientists, as policymakers, as practitioners in the air pollution and climate change nexus, we need to have a, an, an Africa-wide clean air program, which is more or less uh, packaged on its own. But I think that question, although I'm posing it, uh, David Ombisi will tell me that yes, the ministers were tasked uh, already uh, des decided that we should have uh, a program that is uh, covering the continent. But how do we strengthen the regional economic communities? My colleagues who are in this call or in this conference, I think uh, we are open to augment the phrasing that have already presented for this particular session. Yes, I stopped there. Uh, we were expecting to get uh, specific presentations from ECOWAS, but uh, we do note that uh, the EAC, ECOWAS, SADAC, the Northern Africa regions already have these air quality programs, uh, I mean, in, in place. Uh, comments and questions are welcome. Maybe Kevin, you may stop sharing the screen. So, uh, I am moderating, but at the same time, posing this challenge to all of us 
who are on board. Any experiences which are more specific to a particular region is welcome just for two, three minutes per person. I'm looking for hands up. It may not be just the persons who are from the African region, but anybody who has worked on air pollution and climate change in this region. Hello? Yeah, we Am can, I? We can hear you, Alice. Can, you can hear me, but the, yeah, the, the, we can hear you. the room is very loudly silent. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe pose the question again. <laughs> the question that we have is, uh, this is now with regards to our regional air quality agreements. Maybe I speak more slowly. Um, so that we articulate what the challenge is. I think when you listen to the presentation from David Ombisi, and when we also listen to Man's presentation regarding the earlier efforts to have clean air in Africa, uh, we have had a lot of investments, may I say, to help Africa come up with the you know, regional air quality uh, agreements. We also have regional programs with a focus on, you know, enabling Africa to have clean air. What is what? What, what can we say? Do, are we able to make any suggestions in terms of improvements that are needed to effectively implement these air quality agreements, or implement uh, an action plan that will focus on air quality in Africa? Just suggestions. Dr. Alice, I see Jerry, his hand is up. Okay, and Jerry. Risa afterwards. Okay, Jerry, please take the floor, followed by Risa. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kaudi, and thank you, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. So, on the matter that you put uh, to the floor, Dr. Kaudia, uh, what I would like to say is that uh, in my view, we may need to take uh, these regional agreements a little one step further than what they are. If I uh, am uh, not wrong, I, I think you know these agreements were basically agreements uh, put to go together through you know the support of different partners uh, and particularly uh, SCI uh, but then it was merely agreements between ministers for environment so to that extent uh, uh, in my view and I stand corrected they do not uh, have any binding uh, force of law uh, behind them and therefore are more or less, you know, gentlemen's uh, agreements at the level of environment ministers. And uh, I suspect uh, that's perhaps uh, why uh, these agreements uh, haven't uh, moved, you know, to implementation. So I would suggest, you know, that uh, that's a matter that is taken up. Now that there is uh, the initiative uh, through AMSEN to have an Africa-wide uh, uh, look at this perhaps this could become an africa-wide uh, treaty or agreement whatever you want to call it uh, under the au or uh, you know they could be you know treaty-based agreements under the respective uh, treaty-based uh, regional uh, uh, sub blocks so that's really you know what i would suggest number two also taking up from uh, david on bc in terms of uh, you know implementation enforcement and compliance uh, perhaps, you know, we could also work with uh, existing uh, forums within the different uh, sub-regions. For example, in East Africa, uh, there is in existence the East Africa Network for Environmental Compliance and Enforcement, of which uh, our organization, ECI, happens to be uh, the secretariat. And uh, this forum brings, uh, it's an informal forum, but brings together, you know, the EPS and the uh, other players, including civil society, academia, and others. 
And uh, one of the thematic areas that uh, this uh, forum seeks to work around in East Africa is the matter of uh, air quality. So in terms of capacity building, institutional strengthening and that, you know, I, I would suggest that we work uh, with, the, you know, existing forums like this and others in other sub-regions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You have brought up a very important uh, aspect, uh, which is a gap, must I say, in the sense that, yes, we have been working more at the intergovernmental level, interministerial level, we have not been inclusive enough to bring on board the civil society, local communities, uh, the private sector, philanthropies, foundations. As was said at the beginning, we cannot, uh, no, no single institution can tackle air quality or uh, support management of uh, uh, air pollution and climate change in an excess. So we take that on board, possibility of having a treaty. So we move forward. Our next uh, uh, respondent is Riza, followed by Makanji. Makanji, I saw your hand up and then you have put it down. But uh, Riza, please have the floor. Thank you so much. Uh, good day, all. So mine is more just um, more comment maybe just for going forward. Um, but I think a lot of it comes down also to the lack of data uh, that we could use in these assessment periods and in mitigation areas because we don't have reliable data. So a conversation around how we work around this, uh, not just using modeled data, but also maybe access to low cost sensors across different regions in Africa and access to that data for, for scientists to expand on that. Okay, thank you very much, Reza. Yes, that is a recurrent problem. I saw another hand up, but it has gone down. Uh, I'm, I'm here. Oh, you put it down, okay. Uh, no, it, take it the... goes down by itself. <laughs> okay, Makanji. <laughs> okay, please take the floor. Yeah, mine is just to agree with um, uh, Jerry, what he said. Uh, that was Jerry Opondo. And uh, for me, I'm looking at the issue of information. Uh, even as, as much as we talk about uh, uh, these issues, uh, sometimes they, they remain up there. And I've seen it even in other areas of climate change. Does this information uh, go down to the other people who are supposed to use this information? And therefore, for me, I would like to agree with him. For example, um, in many areas, if you talk of Agenda 2063, uh, people respond to it or they know what it's all about. So an Africa-wide thing is quite okay. And together with this, the issue of information, how do we implement capacity development so that uh, matters concerning climate, matters concerning air quality do not remain at the top, but they move down to the lower levels? Thank you. Alice, are you still there? Oh, yes, I'm here. I was just saying thank you, uh, Makanji, for highlighting the need for us to reach the grassroots communities because they are the real beneficiaries of our scientific and policy work. Uh, any other comments? Any other input on action moving forward? Yeah. Um, Alice, can you hear me okay? Um, I can hear you. We have a few comments in the chat. So Samuel um, Achola has said that he was an undergraduate 23 years ago. And even then, the two burning issues in Africa were the lack of data and capacity building for Africa. So he's, he's saying, has Africa been asking the right questions? <laughs> so that's one thing. And then um, uh, Muawaya Shadad asked, um, in the context of climate change, what exactly does air pollution mean? So we've got those two comments coming through the chat. Great, thanks for helping. Yes, Adriana. Yes, hi, sorry. Uh, in case there are French speakers uh, that would like to narrate their questions in French, there's uh, Anderson and Gongang remain available to translate. So I guess 
maybe chair if you could give gongang uh, an opportunity to just say that so that we also be inclusive of our french speakers thank you great andriana thanks that is why we are a team you see how teams work in africa that's how to move forward gongan please uh pick up the questions that have been presented and uh, let us have the french version so that our french speaking team members can also benefit thank you gongan okay okay at least thank you very much uh as he concerned um la actuellement je m'entraîne de parler au sujet de, de, des investissements qui ont été euh, faits en Afrique. Donc, euh, Alice est en train de poser la question à savoir quelles peuvent être les propositions, peut-être par rapport à votre expérience dans les pays francophones, dans votre pays par exemple. Qu'est-ce que vous pensez qui peut être fait pour pouvoir euh, avancer euh, l'agenda en termes de, de la qualité de l'air en Afrique, peut-être en Afrique euh, peut-être de l'Ouest ou bien dans votre pays, ou bien en Afrique en général Donc, euh, il y a donc des questions au sujet peut-être du manque de données qui est, euh, qui, est, qui est listé et qui est un problème. Donc, euh, si vous avez peut-être une question, une réponse ou une proposition par rapport à ça, donc n'hésitez pas de vous faire signaler enfin qu'on vous donne la possibilité de pouvoir parler. Quoi. Donc, c'est en fait de ça qu'il s'agit en ce moment. Merci, Alice. Thank you, Alice. You can go on. Merci beaucoup. Mm -hmm. uh, so, we make progress. I think in terms of investing time on this section, is there any other input? Remember, this is a collective space for us to present ideas on how we can strengthen action on air pollution, climate change nexus. Okay, thank you very much. I think one of the key challenges that were presented during the input in this regional uh, experiences session was that the decisions are made high up there. The ministers make the decisions. The policy makers have the policies formulated, but we are not reaching down to the real beneficiaries of science and policy. So in our next segment, uh, we are delighted to invite uh, Arnold Kipchumba to give us a case experience on a project that uh, tackled uh, reduction of short-lived climate pollutants uh, in Kenya. And uh, this was a, just a case experience so that we are also able to get some gist of what, what happens at the subnational level or at the national level. Uh, Kipchumba, if you're in the house, please take the floor. We can see your screen, Arnold. Yeah, um, thank you so much um, for, for, for that, Alice. I really appreciate. Um, um, and thank you so much for the invitation um, to participate in this um, forum. Um, of course, I want to extend my gratitude to the African Union Commission. Um, is my video on? Okay. We can hear you, Kuchumba, and we can okay, see- Okay, yeah, perfect, you. excellent. Um, so extending my gratitude to the African Union uh, Commission, uh, the Stockholm Environment Institute, uh, the UNEP Regional Office, and uh, uh, CCAC um, for convening this partnership forum um, 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 to discuss part of, um, of the 37 measures um, that were um, highlighted uh, in the integrated assessment for air pollution, climate change for sustainable uh, development in Africa. Um, so my name is Anu Kipchumba. I'm a deputy director in charge of uh, green economy at the office of the first lady uh, in the Republic of Kenya. Um, before then, I was a project officer um, for, um, for the Kenya SLCP project um, that sought to understand the scale and status of short-lived climate pollutants and the effect it has on air quality, climate change, uh, and women's health in Kenya. Um, this is a project that was being implemented under the auspices of Joyful Women Organization, um, which is an institution that uh, is under the patronage of High Excellency, um, the second lady of the Republic of Kenya then and the first lady um, of the Republic of Kenya now. 
Um, and the reason why uh, she was interested um, in supporting um, this project was ideally by the fact that in traditional African societies, Kenya, for example, um, it's, it's women who bear the bigger grant um, when it comes to, to climate change. Um, when it comes to water needs, energy needs, it's women um, who uh, go out there to look for energy. Um, and when it comes to cooking, it's, it's women who spend most time with their children in their kitchens, um, exposing themselves to health damaging um, pollutants um, such as PM 2.5, PM 10, and black carbon. So this is why it became an interest uh, to the first lady, um, the second lady then, I keep on interchanging that, um, to support this project. And some of the objectives that we're looking at was one to quantify uh, black carbon PM 2.5, PM10 um, and establishing their impacts on, on climate change, health, and air quality in Kenya. Also, we were modeling the spatial dispersal of the vehicular emissions, uh, pollutants, and mapping populations at risk um, in Nairobi and, and Nakuru City Council. Um, also, we just wanted to have an understanding in terms of what is the legislative and institutional framework uh, looking like when it comes to um, management and reduction of uh, short-lived climate pollutants. Um, more importantly also was to strengthen um, the capacity of uh, sub-national entities, as maybe some of you might not be aware, Kenya has a devolved system of government gov governance, um, where there's a national government and sub -national, 47 sub-national entities. Just, just so uh, this project also sought to um, have that discussion with sub-national entities in terms of if they understand um, um, what short-lived climate pollutants is um, in the beginning and if um, the planning processes, decision-making and financing also supports um, reduction of short-lived climate pollutants. Um, the other objective also was to engage civil society organizations in terms of just educating and just um, getting to have a feel if they understand what short-lived climate pollutants are. And then also um, recommending strategies on um, on how to strengthen the integration of short-lived climate pollutants into the NDCs at the national level. Um, so this just highlights um, the partners that we are working with, of course, Joyful uh, Women Organization under the patronage of the First Lady of Kenya now. Uh, and the reason why we were using Joyful Women Organization is just to reach out to grassroots communities uh, through the network that High Excellency um, um, is engaging with, um, um, who are organized in groups. Um, and then also Kenya Meteorological Department, they were supporting the project in terms of measurements uh, and also the quantification of the PM 2.5, PM 10 uh, and black carbon and also the Kenya Meteorological Society. Um, the Council of, Governance, of Governors um, as a collaborative institution, um, as a liaison um, to the 47 county governments and also Frederick Chabot Stiftu um, who were supporting us to mobilize the civil society organizations um, um, and educating them on, and, and just getting their feel uh, on, on if they understand what short lived climate pollutants are and what should be the, the strategies and priorities that the country should take. Um, so, with the project, um, actively during the review process of the NDC, um, we submitted a memoranda um, um, on the review of the, of the Kenya updated NDC in 2020. And we are glad to say that uh, inclusion of SLCPs as part of the gases uh, were covered in the NDC, of course, in consistent consistency with IPCC guidelines. And also maybe not clearly, but at least it's the uh, inclusion of just transition as a, as, as a concept for, for climate action was also captured in the revised NDC submitted to an FCCC. Um, so with the study, um, some of the opportunities that we saw is, is that of course, the continent has um, a huge uh, opportunity um, to, to develop sustainably, um, improve human well-being, and protect nature by investing in, in solutions to fight climate change and, and air pollution together. Just looking at the corporate benefits when it comes to reduction of um, short-lived climate pollutants in health, in, in agriculture, um, in transport, um, in education, um, and then also that subnational entities play a complementary role uh, to national governments by enacting local and regional policies and regulations and ensuring that the sources of air pollution um, are compliant. 
But I think more importantly for us and what we found out is that then the subnational entities can even raise more ambitious targets and goals um, when it comes to air quality management and even um, the regulations when it comes to some of the major uh, uh, pollutants. Uh, so I think that's a low hanging opportunity and um, we are more focused and more attention um, if we are to reach the grassroots and local level and more impact of the firm. Of course, um, also CSOs are um, more direct dialogue, um, so engaging in advocacy, um, so just having those conversations, of course, with governments, with the people, um, and giving a voice to the most vulnerable um, groups, in this case, would be women and children, um, um, and then promoting accountability and, and, and promoting a participatory and inclusive disaster risk uh, reduction. Um, So yeah, um, so with the Kenya SLCP project, um, we are now transitioning with the lessons learned now transitioning into larger scale. And that's why this participatory um, forum um, convened is, is very critical. And so from the objectives that we were implementing um, in the Kenya SLCP project, the project has now adopted um, a more strategic, um, what we are calling thematic areas of focus um, to scale up um, some of the lessons learned um, um, in the first phase. And one of the thematic areas, policy, research and development, just continuously um, engaging in, in policy dialogues and conversations and, and research um, and Stockholm Environment Institute is doing a great job. So it would be good um, to partner and development. And then the second uh, thematic area of focus is development of models, uh, scenarios and databases to just provide um, um, data. Uh, and Kevin was just alluding to what, what one of the participants was mentioning that uh, he's been in university 23 years ago and there's still a data gap uh, in Africa. So just continuously doing um, that work. And I know the integrated assessment on air pollution and climate change has done an impressive job um, with creating models and scenarios um, with business as usual and also using Agenda 2063 um, and NDCs, but, but just continuously engaging and updating um, that database to inform decision making. And then, of course, gender and health system strengthening um, um, and also institutional strengthening. Ideally, um, for us, we are looking at just continuing with the great work that we did with subnational entities and civil society organizations, but then maybe at this level, engaging at the African level, um, of course, with Africa Union Commission and AMSEN uh, and, and the regional economic blocks. Um, um, to just engage in these conversations and prioritizing some of this mitigation and, and strategies that we can use to reduce short of climate pollutants. But more importantly, um, strategic communication and outreach. So in terms of how do you communicate all this amazing work um, that, that, for example, CCSC and say has done with the integrated assessment uh, and just communicating that to different policy makers, um, institutions, um, the most affected, um, how is that communicated? So in terms of timeline, uh, so we're just transitioning from the Kenya SLCP and getting into the Africa SLCP, but more importantly, um, because of the interest of our excellency, um, then is also placing her also as a, as a convener or a, or a global ambassador uh, in terms of um, rallying countries uh, and other first ladies. Um, on, on reducing short-lived climate pollutants. So that's a conversation that we are having with CCAC um, um, in terms of how do we position the first lady? How does she um, also mobilize other first ladies and member states uh, to, to rally behind uh, and give a voice towards reduction of short-lived climate pollutants? So, so with my new role and where I see it now is, is that the objective of the First Lady of Kenya is to inspire a women-led um, climate action um, that reduces vulnerability uh, to climate-related events and improve the adaptive capacity of society to climate shocks um, through green economy. I think also just to take us back is that it is the work that we did with the Kenya SLCP project that created some interest of our First Lady here to, to focus on, on environment uh, and climate action. And her main um, um, role, again, as, as mentioned, is to inspire women-led um, climate action. So how do you place women at the forefront uh, in terms of um, climate mitigation and adaptation? Uh, and so 
And at the office, we have some programmatic um, um, uh, flagships that we'll be implementing. Um, but more importantly, that address some of the priority action measures that are also at, uh, identified under the integrated assessment on air pollution and climate change. So under the office, uh, some of the programs that we'll be running, of course, is promotion of clean cooking and lighting. So um, supporting to transition, especially rural communities um, to cleaner sources of, of cooking uh, and also lighting. Um, so we're also exploring um, use of bioethanol. So the amazing work that Coco Networks, for example, is doing in Kenya. So how can that be scaled up, especially to reach um, informal settlement areas, um, you know, people in informal settlement areas and uh, rural households to, to use cleaner sources of um, cooking. But more importantly, also using community health volunteers um, to advocate for adoption of clean cooking technologies and also to um, sort of educate the community about the harmful effects of household air pollution uh, and what it means. Um, so we are looking to engage uh, the CHVs across the country um, to raise awareness and education about the harmful, harmful effects of household air pollution. Also, um, um, making of briquettes for cooking and heating. So we're looking at uh, supporting women groups and young people across the country to establish um, or to catalyze, um, depending on, on funding and capacity on our side, um, uh, briquettes for cooking uh, and heating. And then also carbon capture and storage, uh, as if you're aware, um, the Kenyan government has committed to an ambitious um, goal to plant 15 billion trees uh, by 2032. Um, that will increase the forest cover um, to 30%, quite an ambitious goal. So uh, the Office of the First Lady has also taken a really ambitious target in, uh, in supporting or complementing the mainstream government uh, to deliver on 1 billion um, trees um, using, different using different strategies um, and ideally a, a women-led um, inspired climate action. So the strategy will just focus on women. So supporting women to establish tree nurseries, supporting women to grow green tree uh, commodities uh, like macadamia, cashews, um, even gum arabica, yeah, Acacia Senegal. Um, and so this also plays a critical role in terms of the reduction measures um, that has been identified by the integrated assessment um, um, report. On transport, um, the first lady is very passionate about cycling and we are using that tool and that passion of the first lady to advocate for non motorized transport systems. Um, so engaging um, um, government, Ministry of Transport, um, that designs that are being approved now um, should have, um, you know, should have allocations for non motorized transports for, for cycling and, and working. Of course, uh, the first lady is also looking at it from a point of physical fitness and mental well being. Um, um, but, but then again, it will be beneficial in terms of emission reduction. And in terms of agriculture, um, we are looking at engaging um, these women groups that we'll be supporting us in, this, in, um, in the National Tree Growing Restoration Campaign um, to then use improved manure management um, and also maybe biogas development um, to, to, for cooking. Um, so these are some of the programs that we're looking to implement under the Office of the First Lady. Uh, and when it comes to waste reduction, uh, we are looking at uh, supporting a few um, women-led enterprises in Black soldier farming um, to address uh, organic and food waste um, um, problem in the country. Um, so so um, the next steps in terms of then what we are looking is in terms of um, moving forward is um, getting on board as many actors to co-design um, some of these um, mitigation strategies that I've mentioned, um, engage partners, and of course, look for financing because um, to be able to implement this, um, there has to be financing. Um, and then of course, supporting the women-led because that is the entry point for excellence is just putting women at the forefront. Um, and then more importantly is that um, we will be having a regional conference um, um, in third and fourth to officially communicate um, the results of the, of the Kenya SLCP project. Um, uh, and then of course, officially launch um, the Africa uh, SLCP uh, uh, project. Um, so that is as far much as it is for me. Thank you so much for your time. Uh,
and I'll be free to, to take questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arnold. Uh, kindly, you may you may stop sharing your screen, Arnold, if it's okay. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you very much for that presentation. I think it it brings us closer home to action in terms of <coughs> reaching to the grassroots. Uh, communities. And I think uh, we are in that segment. We have basically completed session two of our program. And in summary, uh, when I look at what we have discussed in this session, uh, some interesting pattern is coming up. Uh, reflecting on what uh, AMSEN is doing, uh, there has been a lot of emphasis for need for action because there's a lot of history of decisions made and no action taken to implement those ministerial de decisions. And there was emphasis to say that this calls for inclusive partnerships. And I would wish to underline inclusive because one of the presenters, one of the members in the, on the floor here also told us that some of these policies are mainly handled at the ministerial level, high level policies, very limited action on the ground. Uh, David also emphasized the importance of having a, a monitoring and evaluation system infrastructure in place. And uh, in this case, it is there for Africa because the monitoring and reporting back on AMSEM decisions is covered through reporting through to the African Union, through the Specialized Technical Committee, and those uh, conversations go up to the summit level, which is uh, the meeting of heads of states of, and, and governments of Africa. When we discussed about cities, and uh, uh, Victor strongly showed the, the big program that C40 cities is having for African cities. Uh, the key message I got there is the importance of this network of mayors, because you see that there are policy decision makers and uh, actor enabler, action enablers at the city level. And therefore, uh, it shows again the importance of uh, the need to pay special attention to cities in Africa as they are, uh, as we quickly urbanize as a continent. Our conversation on the regional uh, blocks brought out one key gap and that is the need for a legally binding treaty either at a continental level or at the city uh, or at the regional level. And I think uh, the call to action here is that we need to initiate and move on with a conversation that can make some of the decisions that we make at ministerial level uh, actionable uh, through uh, a legally binding instrument as possible. I know that's a long haul. It can take many, many, many decades, but uh, it's always good to get started than waiting to be pushed. The last presentation on uh, Kenya SLCP project has given us a very good example of science policy practice uh, uh, partnership. Uh, which is inclusive because there was mention of special interest groups like uh, youth and children. And uh, also the idea of using community health workers as communicators of uh, information, high level policy uh, decisions um, translated into uh, understandable communication material so that we are able to reach out to these uh, 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 subnational and uh, I would say even village level actors and beneficiaries of our research and policy. There was also a mention of uh, the Kenya's first lady coming on board as a champion for uh, uh, action on uh, reduction of SLCPs and climate change. And I think that reminded me that uh, one of our team members, Kevin, just sent a, a reminder, which was uh, today, and with that reminder, we requested all participants to please give some response to our call on uh, the need, if you are interested in uh, joining the community of practice in any of the five areas, and also if you'd wish to join uh, the, the championships. I think in summary, that is what we have had in session two. And uh, as we move forward, maybe at this point, we may need to take a, a health break. Uh, you may grab um, 
and uh, we call it air burgers in this part of our country when you are actually eating nothing but just taking a rest, but we need a health break. Uh, so we will be back uh, in uh, after 15 minutes, and uh, that is will be at, uh, uh, would I say, let's be back at 1610 East Africa time. Is that okay? And when we will come back, just to give you some good excitement about the next session, we'll have first the speech from the African Union Commission, which will be read uh, by uh, Caroline. And uh, please don't miss the speech because again, it will give us a policy direction on how we are moving forward. We will take a, brief, a very, very short break. And thank you so much for your active participation so far. Uh, Andriana has said thank you very much on the chat and that we can take a break now. Thank you, Alice. See you soon. See you soon. Enjoy your air coffee, air tea, air burger. <laughs> I might go for the real thing. <laughs> <laughs>
Andrean, I can see you on board. Maybe we try and get started. Excellent, uh, let's do so. Good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to this third part of, uh, that third, uh, part of this session. And this session is going to be a panel discussion. So I would like to start this session off. This session is a panel discussion, which is a critical segment of the consultative forum. The panel discussion will aim to identify means of implementing 37 measures across Africa based on lessons learned from existing partnerships. But before we begin this session, I'd like to ask Caroline if she is online. Caroline will give us the opening remarks on behalf of the African Union Commission. Caroline, please proceed. Good uh, afternoon, good morning, good evening. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Yeah, we can hear you. Nice okay. and clear. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delivering these uh, remarks on behalf of uh, Excellency Ambassador Josefa Sacco, Commissioner for Agriculture, Rural Development, Blue Economy and Sustainable Environment at the African Union Commission. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor and pleasure for me to give these remarks at this inaugural partnership forum on integrated action on air pollution and climate change in Africa. I would like to acknowledge and appreciate our partnership with the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, the United Nations Environment Programs Regional Office for Africa, and the Stockholm Environment Institute for the work that we have been doing, we've been doing on the integrated assessment of air pollution and climate change for sustainable development in Africa. This work has now culminated into this inaugural partnership forum to come up with an implementation roadmap for the recommendations from the assessment. The integrated assessment showed that if Africa can successfully implement the 37 measures identified, which are already under implementation or planned in some member states, nationally determined contributions, then up to 800,000 premature deaths can be prevented by 2063 from exposure to outdoor polluted air. Additionally, the implementation will prevent the loss of up to 11% of wheat yields in parts of Africa. The measures have potential to greatly reduce regional climate change in Africa, significantly re reducing further desert desertification and improving food availability. It is important to note that the implementation of the 37 measures can set the continent on a clean development pathway towards realization of the key development priorities of Agenda 2063, the Africa we want, as well as the objectives of the African Union Climate Change and Resilient Development Strategy and Action Plan. Ladies and gentlemen, the 18th session of the African Ministerial Conference on Environment adopted decision 18.4, which urged African countries to support further development and implementation of the 37 measures as a continent-wide Africa clean air program coordinated by strong country-led initiatives cascaded to the regional economic communities and higher levels of policy. Considering this, the Commission is ready to work with all relevant partners, regional economic communities, and member states in coordinating the implementation of the proposed Africa Clean Air Program. More specifically, the Commission will take the lead in mobilization of resources to ensure the development of a continental clean air program to, among other things, strengthen data on air quality and to work with member states to strengthen their national air quality management programs. Furthermore, the Commission will explore the establishment of a convention on transboundary air quality management in Africa that builds upon the existing regional framework agreements on air pollution led by the regional economic communities. 
And finally, I just want to thank you all for attending this inaugural partnership forum and look Caroline, we, we, I think we lost you at the end there. When you got to oh, finally. Where, where did you lose me? I was just about to say, and well, you said, and finally, and then I lost you. I don't know if everyone else did, but I, I definitely did. Okay, I can read that again. Okay, great. Yes. I thank you all for attending this inaugural partnership forum and look forward to tangible outcomes from this event. This is the time for clean air for Africa. I thank you all. Thank you very much, Caroline. We actually had the, the last statement and it's very important to have that rallying call. So without much ado, I'd like to invite the panel um, to this discussion. The panel will actually aim to enlighten us on lessons learned from experience with implementation of continental regional programs or projects on air pollution management in specific sectors. How are the challenges addressed if there were challenges encountered? What opportunities exist? What partnerships are involved, but also what partnerships are needed? Who do we need to partner with for an effective continental program on clean air? So I would like to invite uh, the panelists and I would like to give you a very short snippet of their bios, uh, which are quite impressive. So I'll start off with uh, Dr. Philip Osano. Dr. Philip Osano is the lead is the lead from Stockholm Environment Institute in the assessment. He's part of the core coordination team that we've been working on since 2019. He's also a center director for the Stockholm Environment Institute African Center. Philip is an environmental policy expert with diverse research on uh, experience on biodiversity and ecosystem governance agricultural policy and climate change adaptations. And then we also have online, I noted that we have Dr. Alfonso Samari. Um, he's from the African Development Bank, who is also a partner for the assessment. He is a regional principal officer at the African Development Bank. He leads the bank's work on climate change and green growth in 13 countries in the bank region. He supports uh, countries on access to climate finance for implementing climate actions. And then I would also like to invite uh, Victor Nthusi. Victor Nthusi is a research fellow at the Health Effects Institute. Victor has an MSc in environmental chemistry and has over eight years experience in supporting programs in the implementation of the Global Air Quality Program at UNEP, Economy Division, as well as the Science Division. He has also worked to support implementation of air quality monitoring activities aimed at evaluating related health impacts. So I'll ask each panelist a question to guide the discussion. Please feel free to post questions on the chat, which we will refer to. Each speaker will have five minutes to respond to the question, and then we'll open the floor for discussions. Your comments, interventions should be directed by the overarching aim of this session. That is building a roadmap to guide African Union Commission and partners in the coordination of the program Clean Air for Africa. We are standing by to document expressions of interest to lead, champion, support, or partner. So I'd like to start off with Dr. Philip Osano. Philip, SCI Africa support, uh, supports partnerships working with multiple key stakeholders to address major environmental challenges in energy and climate change in East, South, and Western African regions. SAI has been instrumental in undertaking the assessment of which has generated 37 measures across five sectors. What could be the ideal partnership arrangement for an African-wide program on air pollution and climate change? Please proceed, Philip. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrena. I'll be uh, representing uh, Dr. Philip Osano for SCI Africa. So just as a brief introduction, uh, my name is Anderson Kebula. I'm the uh, 
program leader for energy and climate change at SEA Africa. So uh, thanks very much, uh, Andrena, for giving me the opportunity to answer this very important question. And to begin with, um, just an overview of SEI. So SEI is, some, is a leading knowledge institution that work uh, you know, continuously to prioritize research and generating new knowledge on optimal ways in which the environment can be leveraged as a source of uh, practical economic solutions in Africa. So to this end, SCI work in Africa actually focusing on building and strengthening partnerships. And I provide four relevant examples here of what uh, we've been doing together with other partners. First of all, SCI work with the UNEP's Regional Office for Africa and the African member states of the UN to publish a report on actions on air quality in Africa, which reviews the actions carried out to control emissions of air pollutants in most important sectors, including industry and energy, transport, household energy, as well as forestry and agriculture. In addition, the review actually looks at the legislative and regulatory actions that governments have taken to improve air quality in Africa. Some of the gaps that we identified in the report point to the need to promote partnership with the private sector to scale up the adoption of appropriate technologies, such as for waste management or clean cooking. So second, partnership is that SEA has supported national governments in developing relevant policies, institutional frameworks, as well as technical capacity for effective air quality management around Africa. And more specifically, this stream of work has involved working closely with the clean and climate, uh, the climate and clean air coalition, in supporting countries to develop national action plans for short-lived climate pollutants, these NAPs have contributed towards meeting countries' NDC targets under the Paris Agreement, while also contributing to reducing of air pollution and yielding both health and economic benefits. Third. SEI, working in partnership with national and regional institutions, have played an instrumental role in the development of the regional framework argument on air pollution, which can serve as a building block for an African-wide clean air program. Finally, SEI, in partnership with UNEP, is currently establishing a consortium for better air quality data, which is a platform that seeks to co-design projects an initiative that mobilizes resources to develop national capacity to monitor air quality. The platform go ahead to facilitate the exchange of experience as well as knowledge and information among national and international communities to promote some sort of a learning environment. And lastly, this platform seeks to develop collective strategies to upscale practical solutions by leveraging ongoing effort and expertise to support evidence-based practice. So in a nutshell, these partnerships can be achieved by working with regional policymakers, government agencies, development partners, knowledge producers, the private sector, the private sector, as well as local community groups to drive climate and air quality actions as an investment opportunity and a source of socioeconomic development that is championed in high level member states policy reforms, policy forums, such as the African Ministerial Conference on Environment, the United Nations Environment Assembly, and the African Union, as the case with the recently completed reports on actions on air quality in Africa and the integrated assessment of air pollution and climate change for sustainable development in Africa. So this report uh, are underpinned by strong science that produces knowledge for policy actions with mitigation and adaptation considered as complementary with multiple co-benefits, including but not limited to air, clean air, green jobs creation, public health benefits, as well as biodiversity improvement. However, the middle challenge is translating this adaptation and mitigation policy measures 
to tested and validated project actions that drive sustainable economic development in Africa. So to conclude, providing technical support to countries to enable them to translate their air quality and climate actions into actionable implementation strategies that are capable of attracting market-driven investments by diverse groups, including the youth, the informal sector actors, as well as the private sector, is critical for the success of an Africa-wide program on air pollution and climate change. So, Andriana, it is on that note that I'll come to the end of our submission, and I thank you very much. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Anderson. And Anderson, you've done like myself, you failed to introduce yourself. So Anderson, please do so. Um, let us know who you are, and uh, because I know very well that you're not Philip. Yes, so uh, again, my name is Anderson Kebila, uh, the Program Leader for Energy and Climate Change at the Stockholm Environment Institute. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anderson. And uh, we are looking out for questions or comments or interventions in the chat. And with that, a uh, very insightful submission from Dr. Anderson Kavila. We will go on to Dr. Alfonso Samari. Uh, I believe that you're still online. Um, can you indicate if you can hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Good, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. Good. So um, please, uh, I would like to pose the question. So the African Development Bank has various financial products that could be assessed by a continental program like the one proposed, the African Clean Air uh, Program. Um, in your experience, what type of financial products by the bank could be sourced by a continental program such as the one we envisage today? Thank you. Thank you um, for the question. And thank you for the warm welcome. I, I have to say it's a very great honor to be part of this conversation today. Um, and I call it a conversation because we, we're touching on, a, on an issue that is very relevant, but also this conversation uh, is happening uh, at, at a time that is very critical, um, both within the continent of Africa, but also across the globe. And let me say, look, I'm joining in from Abidjan, so I'm some outside, actually outside Abidjan in Ivory Coast, um, and this internet is not too perfect. So at some point, um, if I see fluctuations, I'll put off the video. Um, but why I thought it was very important for us to be part of this conversation today, um, it's largely around the fact that we're beginning to appreciate posting, we're going to begin to appreciate the value of an integrated approach um, to our development. So whether it is air pollution, whether it's climate change, whether it's a biodiversity crisis we're talking about, um, whether it is um, circularity, ways, uh, we're beginning to appreciate the value of looking at solutions that are very specific to solving multiple problems at the same time. Um, and that said, it means also that when we begin to look at financial uh, innovations, we're not looking at innovation for one, uh, the expense of the other. Um, the approach helps us to be able to also make sure that we governize enough financial resources. So uh, um, at the African Development Bank, we don't have a standalone uh, air pollution type of project. But within the bank safeguard, um, both environment, social, and climate safeguard system, which is embedded in every development project that we engage in, um, we have air pollution integrated in that. And I think this is very, very important to, to be able to appreciate the fact that um, the development work of today requires that we just don't, we just don't follow the approach of do no harm. We also look at how we can use development finance to be able to um, improve our engagement in certain key areas that may not necessarily stand on their own in terms of their own financial structure. So, um, and it's the same with the climate change as well. I see the link here. Because um, at the bank, we don't have a climate change project. 
what we have is climate informed uh, development projects. So in the same vein, we don't have a standalone biodiversity project. We have um, a development project that integrates biodiversity and the rights in that. So establishing that is very important because then, um, so as we move development finance and ultimately use that development finance to leverage green now climate finance, we're able to do multiple things at the same time and we're able to achieve multiple outcomes. So embedding that in an integrated approach is the starting point. That is the enabling environment for the development finance or whatever form of finance within our, um, within our care um, to, to channel or to flow in that direction. That is the first point that is very critical. The second point again is um, we're learning by doing. And, um, and I'd like to put it in a way that um, in the past, we've been able to focus some of our investment in a way that um, if there was a major air pollution as part of the operations, um, we, we would say no to those kind of investments. But that was not enough. It was also important to help this investment to see how do you create abatement mechanisms and how do we create resources for that? So if the business, if the cost of that abatement or that control measures will be a little bit higher than normal cost of the investment, then we're able to have us to dip our hands into different pockets of resources that we have, such as um, mostly grant resources, or even providing technical assistance, or extremely concessional funds in order to be able to address that. So the, the opportunity to address those measures have been a driving force. In, in expanding the financial product that we have in order to reach that. But again, like I said, it's learning by doing. So it's not completely say no to something. It's about giving them the option to say, including incentives um, uh, in terms of capital in order for them to be able to integrate those control measures or those mitigation measures as we call them. Um, the third part is still links to finance is um, what I consider to be very important. In this work that we do, we've also learned that sometimes you have to fly as you're building the plane. You have to fly as you're building the plane. So you will never get everything that you need. So the technology for assessments are improving and we're very happy to have partners like SCI and others here who are very much pushing the boundaries of the technologies uh, for assessment we, um, we, we are also able to do our work differently by using a lot more of um, expertise that are, may not necessarily be available within the bank, but available within our partner institutions. And by building that together, we keep making steps forward as we continue to build that partnership that is needed. Let me finally say this. Um, what the bank does is to recognize that as you move towards that financing mechanisms, you will need to spend some upfront capital in doing things that may be very boring. I use the mundane things, and such are things like investing in enabling environment, policy framework, um, or even capacity development. And, and, and most times, most investors may not see the value of that. So you need development finance, you need MDBs like ours to be able to uh, put capital on the table, a very patient capital that may be seen result decades down the line, but you're able to provide those technical assistance. Um, in some cases, you know, um, provide um, grant resources for the government to be able to build the policy framework needed. In some cases, support the research work in universities and research centers in order to improve on technologies but also to support the adoption of those technologies. Um, when we talk about financial products, we often don't talk about that. We, we just talk about what billions of dollars on the table. But these early investments are very important in order to be able to drive the policy agenda forward in the right direction, in order to be able to catalyze the skill of investment that we need. And that's where you find organizations like the bank. And that's what we have been doing over the years. Then when you eventually translate into large-scale investment projects, 
under the safeguard system that we put in place, we're able to provide incentives for either private investment or public uh, corporations or even non-governmental organizations who are invested, who are interested in large-scale investment to have access to the type of capital that we provide and ultimately see that work um, on the ground in Africa. So on just a summary, um, this is a very timely conversation. Um, it's important to appreciate the, the integration uh, and the integrativeness of, of this conversation along with other issues. Um, we don't look at one thing in isolation, but we're able to link that together. And then when we are able to do that, as we use development finance, we have an opportunity to achieve multiple outcomes um, through the different instruments that we have from equity to guarantees, from different types of debt, um, all kinds of you know, debt and all of those structures. But more importantly as well, we must understand that there's a layer of work that needs to be done in investing capital upfront, um, in building, for building an enabling environment, for building the knowledge we need, the partnership, the capacity we need. And oftentimes it's the development finance that AFDB provides. That's able to do that. And, and, and look, uh, I know in the interest of time, I'll be able to share examples of some of them, uh, but I'll keep it there for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And that was a very good submission. And I think that uh, people here on the call, participants on the call, are further enlightened on how they can assess finance for the kind of initiatives and programs that we are seeing as part of the Clean Air Program. And so without much ado, I would like to go to Victor. Victor, air pollution is recognized as a key environmental driver escalating the burden of disease, especially in developing regions such as Africa. The assessment, for example, shows over 800,000 800, deaths can be avoided through implementation of the 37 measures by 2063. What could be an effective partnership structure to effectively manage air pollution in Africa to ensure maximum health benefits? Please proceed, Victor. Um, thanks, Adriana. Just give me a hand, a thumbs up if you can hear me. Oops, you went off camera. Um, I'm good? Okay, thanks. Um, so first of all, thank you for, for having us as HEI, um, the African Union Commission, SCI, UNFCC, SC for um, organizing this forum. Um, so I'd just like to start by contextualizing the health case in terms of air pollution and, you know, um, what we know, don't know, and what we think we know. Um, so there's various estimates out there. The assessment itself has, has, done, has run some estimates. Um, I won't go into the numbers, but by and large, you know, it's a problem. Um, different estimates done differently show us that, you know, we have a reason to act. There's a health case for action uh, in terms of the health burden or the disease burden. Um, we are getting to a point now where we are starting to see what looks like um, uh, epidemiological transition. It's already happened in Asia where, you know, traditionally in Africa, infectious diseases still are, you know, the number one uh, drivers um, and non-communicable diseases are starting to go on the rise. Um, and that's, that's, those are signs that we're beginning to see. And, you know, um, some obvious, some rather not so obvious, uh, depending on where you are on the continent. And it's, 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 it's quite diverse in terms of how uh, people are experiencing air pollution. Um, so at HEI, we are US-based. Uh, our work in Africa is at, it, it, at its infancy. Um, but that being said, I would like to share some of the lessons we've learned in some of our efforts um, on the topic. Um, we sort of do targeted science um, and strategic communication on that in terms of just diluting the top heavy epidemic epi studies and all these kinds of things to in ways and forms that are easily understandable and you can have a conversation around that as journalists, as citizens, as you know, hardcore scientists, etc. Um, so I'll focus on two key lessons learned in the course of our um, um, sort of rolling out programs in different regions. Uh, one is uh, that sustained support is critical for action. Um, support comes in two ways in, in this sense. It could be financial, it could be human resource, um, we tend to steer away from capacity building. Uh, there was a question in the chat, you know, uh, someone said that they've been in this for 23 years, they've always had data and capacity building, to more towards a capacity strengthening sort of conversation. So sustained support, what does that look like? In many cases, we know the what. Uh, let me take a, a sector like waste, which is one of the sectors in, in the assessment. Uh, if you live in Nairobi, for instance, my sort of home city, you can see waste is a problem. 
But the, the how is where the issue comes in. You know, how do we deal with this? You may not connect it to air pollution, but you know it's not good for your environment. You know, you don't want to live in certain sort of environment for your health, for the environment, and for loved ones around you. So pick any sector. You know, the what is in many cases uh, known what we need to do. The how is where the problem now comes in, in terms of uh, human capacity, financial, and things like that. So one of the lessons we've seen, you know, sustained support in that sense is critical for action and long-lasting action. Um, the second point is a uh, subject for, you know, a longer conversation, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, so it is important for us to, you know, have different thematic areas on the table. Um, we are sort of, someone said in one forum, we are trained in silos, we get to practice in silos. If you think of your training sort of academically and whatnot, you know, you're trained as an engineer, you get out and you practice as an engineer. At the scale of problem we are looking at, uh, as, as air pollution as it is, we need, you know, multi-sectoral, or multifaceted sort of um, a response, which is um, what the assessment also is telling us. Um, so this is one of the other things we've seen in, in the different geographies where we've uh, sort of um, had uh, the pleasure of, you know, rolling out different programs. Um, in terms of, you know, what we would suggest, you know, as possible, what a partnership would look like. In our experience, I'd say we, we, there's different scales to the problem. So if you're looking at, you know, this as a transboundary issue, uh, the issue of a continental air quality frameworks comes into play. You may want to do something at that scale. If you're looking at this more at a more localized scale, um, maybe a sub-regional kind of community of practice or arrangement may work. Uh, we have examples to go with that. You know, uh, UNEP has done well in sort of harmonization of uh, fuel vehicles, um, fuel emission standards at sub-regional level, the COAS, ESC, and SATIC. So maybe that's one thing to explore. Uh, at national local city level, we've heard from C40 and the efforts there. There is something to do at that level as well. So air pollution is looked at so many different levels. Um, and at HEI, you may have heard of the State of Global Air Initiative. Uh, we have a platform that sort of provides some level of data to start a conversation at all these different regional, sub-regional, national scale. And now we've recently done one at city scale as well, looking at um, NO2, um, nitrogen dioxide as a pollutant. So I guess in summary, what I'd like to say uh, in our experience, partnership building is uh, a bit like peeling uh, an onion. So at the end of the day, you know, you'll make good food. But as you, through the process of peeling, you have very painful conversations, you'll cry along the way. But as long as you have your target in mind, um, it's it's worthwhile. And, you know, uh, we're happy to be part of this conversation at this stage. Um, so I'll end there. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for that submission, Victor. And I forever hold that vision in my head. Partnership building is like peeling an onion. It is painful. You may cry, but in the end, you will have food. So with that, I would like to invite um, either Alice or Kevin to uh, flag any comments that are in the chat that we need that need to be addressed, um, either generally by this community or uh, the panelists. Um, so. Um, can you see any comments addressed to either Victor, to Funzo, or to Anderson? There's one comment coming in from Amin Aminata um, about tackling air pollution is indeed a priority for African countries due to health impact and e economy losses. Lack of data needs to be addressed, but also uh, poor regulations is a big issue. And um, they're saying that, for example, ECOWAS guidelines on fuel and vehicle emissions should go forward and be implemented in locally by countries and um that's something that you know that the uh that provision to actually do those that regulation was actually mentioned in the um uh the ECOWAS agreement the Abidjan agreement from 2009 so it relates to these things have been um mentioned for a long time but how do we actually get action so that's one one comment um, Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, please go on. Can't see any others that relate to the, the latest presentations. Um, someone was um, worried about the fact that this, we seem to be coming from a climate, the climate side. 
um, the person you explained to Andriana in the in the uh, chat about um, they were asking about where the emissions come from and how they're related to air pollution and climate change, and they say that um, a statement like "it is time to clean the air for Africa" is a good statement, but not in the context of climate change. So he said, if if the statement was not in the context of climate change, he would have uh, applauded the speaker. <laughs> but I, I, was, I tried to explain to him in the in the chat that it's it's not about the um, it's not it's not climate first. It's air, air pollution is the priority. But as you clean the air for air pollution and to help people's health and the environment, you can have these attendant climate benefits, which is good for Africa to show leadership. But also that you know the climate change emissions is really a problem outside of Africa. So. We've had that conversation in the chat, but um, those those are basically that's basically the uh, the content of the chat at the moment. Unless I've missed something. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. I think I would like to open the floor for uh, submissions uh, from uh, our participants. Uh, please look out for any hands up. And as we wait for hands up, I would like to reiterate uh, what the panelists uh, put forward from the very beginning from Anderson. Um, of the work for Stockholm Environment Institute with multilateral institutions, um, partnerships with national governments, but also sub-national governments in, 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 uh, in planning, in uh, submission of NDCs, data underpinning that, information underpinning that, as well as the regional frameworks, and um, a call to upscale these solutions, and um, the challenges might be in translating policy to action. We've had that many times, and looking at technical support, but also that critical mention of youth and the informal sector that was also mentioned by Dr. Richard Munang. Um, are there any hands up, uh, uh, Kevin? Um, not that I can see. All right, and then from Alfonso, uh, we actually had the importance of integrated lens. And I'm wondering on this community of practice, the cry for resources is, always uh, quite significant and prominent. So that we have FDB here in our panel. This is the opportunity to ask how clean air can be funded. So we've heard from Funzo that climate informed development is actually a way to put forward air pollution in terms of funding. Um, if the project inter integrates development, integrates climate and also integrates biodiversity, that is easier or at least it gets the, 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 the attention to possibly get funding. Um, we've heard that um, from Fonzo that uh, we have multiple outcomes. Would they actually support enabling environment? And especially this project needs to have considerations for abatements, control measures, that, should, that needs to be included in projects. Now, and then Fonzo also reminded us that you have to fly while building an aeroplane. And I had an, an, an image of those brothers that build the, the Karas brothers that build the plane that flew close to the sun. So I hope that is not the case for the clean air program for Africa. Um, but uh, Funzo has also mentioned that there's capacity building and technical assistance. So I'm calling again the community of practice and saying Funzo is here from the African Development Bank, and we need to then put him to task to understand how we can fund this going forward. So again, Kevin, uh, if there's any hands, just um, stop me in my monologue uh, as I go on to- um, Adriana, can I, can I come in? Yes, sure, Kunzo, please go ahead. Good, thank you. Um, so I, I was quite um, pleased to hear the point made about when someone said, look, maybe I would have clapped for the speakers if they didn't mention climate change. And, and I do understand that, but I think we also have to be, as much as possible, be very honest about the, 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 the society that we're in today. You can't look at air pollution in a, in, a, in a vacuum. Because even if you remove climate change, you can look at air pollution through the lens of the, the fast urbanizing state of the African continent. We're a very urbanizing continent. Um, and actually the truth is, we our population is gonna double by 2050. 80% of that population increase is gonna happen in cities. So if today's cities already have a, bad, a high level of pollution, you can expect what tomorrow's cities are gonna look like. So even if you don't measure climate change at all, you can talk about air pollution within the notion of urbanization. 
So, uh, and I think it's very important to be able to do that. And it's the same way you're going to expect the financing, that you're not just going to say, I have an air pollution reduction project. What is, the, what is the goal of that? What is it leading to? What development outcome are you going to be able to uh, tie to that? Now, the advantage that we have is that there's a global momentum on climate change. Uh, to be honest, we wish we could have as much momentum on almost everything, including poverty, including biodiversity loss, including desertification. But the smart thing to do is if you have a dominant idea globally that is a generating the level of momentum, in interest, knowledge, like we've seen in climate change, there's an opportunity to create integrative models and you frame issues in an integrative way as opposed to an individual way. That's the point I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you very much, Funzo. And as you were speaking, I was seeing the chat coming up with the comments. Um, so I would like to ask uh, the person, I think Philip put that comment. Would you like to speak to that and then um, ask the question or the comment? So, yes, th thank you. And Diana, can you hear me? Yeah, I just wanted, uh, I think there are two, two innovative facilities that are, are being, or at least operational at the bank. One is the, the methane fund, um, and the other one is the global, the green mobility facility for Africa, which I know is already providing about 1 million US dollars worth of fund to promote e-mobility, e-car schemes in Rwanda and Kenya. And I think we would like to hear from Fools how these are operating and what are the opportunity for scaling this up. Good, thank you, Philip. Um, very good point as well. Actually, um, in addition to those two facilities you've just talked about, we also have the African Secular um, Economy Facility, ACEF, A-C-E-F. And I'm basically uh, looking into issues about uh, either similar to uh, material reductions in, um, in landfills and waste, or looking at uh, even material reductions in agriculture, but also looking more strategically into uh, developing entrepreneurship opportunities, um, and as well as supporting the work that I talked about, the enabling environment. At the early stage, if we we're working with the government that we were thinking about, government putting in place the right policies, but also the right incentives as well, you know, through the type of laws that they have, um, that they need to have. In some cases, push the agenda toward, closer to even the parliaments, um, just to be able to, to, to get that level of uh, interest and also the level of uh, um, support that you have within the policy level. But within research um, or within, uh, advocacy level or within even uh, entrepreneurship or investment level, some of these um, facilities that you have, including like um, the green mobility facility, they help you to help you have that capital that help you to manage the risk, you know, or for investors, for most of you who understand the investment, there's, there's a landscape of value of debt. And a, a grant capital of a by million dollars can help you reach proof of concept, can help you reach uh, new market opportunities, and the bank provides those resources. Now, I, I'm, I'm the first to acknowledge that it's not enough. Um, I mean, you know, when you when you when you compare that to the need on the continent, but it's a starting point. And and what I find is to be sustainable in the long run. It's look, you have to be able to create linkages. Uh, I can't say that enough, um, but I'll be happy to um, pass some links about these facilities to the organizers so that this, it doesn't end here. We can continue to provide information within this community of practice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Funzo. And I'm happy to see these comments coming through. And uh, I think there was another comment that I might have missed. Um, right, is there a comment that I've missed, uh, Kevin? Yeah, sorry, I was <laughs> trying to get to my uh, mute button. Yes, there is. <laughs> and um, it was from, let me just scroll up, uh, from Jerry. So uh, Jerry, do you want to take the floor to, to, to 
um, to give your comment to Afonso. Uh, thanks, Kevin. So yeah. uh, I'm just interested to hear a little bit from Afonso uh, in terms of uh, follow up mechanisms for uh, environmental safeguards in the projects that are funded by the bank. Uh, usually, you know, in the proposals and in the pitches by the respective governments and other players, I mean, there'll be very beautiful uh, safeguards uh, written into these documents and uh, perhaps as preconditions for funding. But what sort of uh, follow up mechanisms would there be in place to ensure that uh, what they say they will do is actually what they do, and particularly with respect to abatement of air pollution? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, very good question. Uh, and, and look, it's actually important to emphasize that if anyone has ever seen any of the environmental and social impact assessment of any projects implemented by the bank, infrastructure wise, uh, mostly, um, you will see the level of extensive work that we do on impact um, air pollution now, we don't do this as individual. It's, it's a prerequisite for the client, the borrowing client, um, to be able to do that. Now, and I know, Jerry, and you may say, well, they can put anything in there. You know, um, what mechanisms do you have to verify if it's true or not, or if, it's, if it was work well done or not? And look, this is Africa, you know? But the truth about it is that what we do is, we have a disclosure policy where um, beyond sending some of this report to SPOT within the country or in some to, for, for review, whatever is produced there, structure be project, Jerry, we're interested to know that it must be disclosed for a period of 120 days. Um, look, we, we're, we're losing time. We're, we're very impatient when it comes to we want things on the ground. We want the projects to happen. But at the same time, you want to do it in a way that you don't compromise on the safeguards, particularly when it touches on the environment, issues of health, issues of labor, um, and the like. So what we do is that we put that out there. And if you've got a very strong civil society um, in the country, they are usually the first to flag a number of things to say, look, this is not correct, or this is right, or even an international organization that is interested in uh, making sure that that project um, does not compromise on some, some, some standards. Else, and that, and we, we get that. And we actually have, and I'm talking about the mechanism now, we have a separate body within the bank, independent body does, um, that makes sure that they deal with that. And we have had projects being canceled. We, we have had projects going through a long delay because they needed to satisfy a number of things, particularly those environmental related covenants and treaties that we are signatories to. We, do not compromise, we don't compromise on that. And we do have an institutional framework in getting that done. So now what that means for you, Jerry, is be free to raise or to flag any project that they cooked up numbers on air pollution. Um, and we will be very happy to take that forward. Um, no, look, it, it's very important because the development part of it is that you're able to create a platform for everyone to be part of it. Um, from the research body, uh, to the civil society, to the communities who are gonna be beneficiaries of that. And look, and if it gets to a point where projects need to be canceled, they will be canceled. Thank you very much, Funzo. I see you, Godwin, and I think this is the last question we'll take uh, before closing this uh, very insightful session. Godwin, please go ahead. Thank you, Andriana. Mine is just a follow-up question uh, and still directed to Funzo. And uh, I think uh, if I go very clearly, what you're asking is the follow-up uh, mechanism. Uh, before the projects are funded, they do the EIR that's funded. When they're now operational, when the project is over, the follow-up mechanism like the audits, that, that's I think what you meant. What are the structures that uh, ADB has sort of was issued to do with the air quality There's some measurements that are supposed to be taken uh, during uh, construction. So after construction has been done and they're done with that. So during operation time, 
what are the follow-up mechanisms? Because they present that in the EI report. So what about the follow-up mechanisms? Do you have something for ADB along those lines? Okay, um, I was hoping your question, Godwin, was going to be for other speakers. Um, but okay, um, thank you. Thank you for bringing my attention to that. Uh, look, every project is honed by the client and the beneficiaries uh, of the project. It's not honed by the bank funding the project. It's very important. Um, it may be financed by the project, but it's not honed by the project. By it's not honed by the bank. bank. Um, so what is very important is during even construction period, we have supervision um, visit, we have supervision review. I actually, in some cases, depending on the, the complexity of the project, you could have them up to three, four times in a year. And think about that for a period of five years. Now, you've done a lot of work to get it approved, even after approval, you don't answer. A lot of those things, because what you do is that once you have an approval, there's a legal document the bank will sign with the country uh, on that loan or that investment. That legal contract also has environmental covenant, and it's an agreement that these following things must be done, whether it's tree planting, whether it's continuous um, safeguard implementation, all of them. And when they are done, when the project is finally completed, the project becomes uh, an asset of the country. Um, and that. So it's very important that usually once you have helped the country and, and not, not a conditionality, but rather working together with the country to build and to put this infrastructure as well as following the safeguard system in place, it becomes something part of it. Um, for the continuity, because there are some of the agreements that are, take for instance, a road project. Some of the agreements have elements of operation and maintenance. So every six months, you must do certain things. It's part of the agreement and the covenant um, that, mu that must be respected. Um, I'm sorry if you're expecting me to say, look, we can say, we're gonna pull out a big whip and say, look, give us back our money. No, not at all. Um, and I think it's very important to situate the conversation around air pollution, around partnership. It's going to be partnership. And partnership, mutual support. We recognize your strength. We recognize your weakness. We see where do we work together? How do we leverage on our strengths um, and, and the strength of our other partners, like some of you here, to support the work of the government so that it becomes something that is internally owned by them. And let's not forget that keyword partnership all throughout it. Even when it comes to project implementation, that looks like it's very transactional, that is still that partnership uh, spirit that we must not lose sight of. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Futsal. And um, I do not want to finish this panel without acknowledging all of you and, acknowledge and, and saying thank you for being in this panel and giving us your interventions. And I would like to put it to you that if you are a participant in this meeting, you should take note as you are trying to put that project together, request for uh, financing that um, Stockholm Environment Institute stands by to provide that very critical uh, bridging between science and policy, but obviously HEI as well, represented by Victor here, also stands in place to ensure that you consider the health impacts that um, that project could have in putting that integrated lens that we've talked about. But at the end of this session, and I would like to take this back to Alice. And before I do so, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Andriana Bandi. I'm with the United Nations Framework for Climate Change Convention, high level climate champions. And the high level climate champions critically put state and non-state actors. And in that program, I lead and support on uh, waste particularly to eliminate open waste burning in Africa and elsewhere. So thank you very much and over to you, Alice. Thank you, Andriana, for navigating this uh, uh, session so effectively. I see Kevin, your hand is up and Adams Kamara, you want to make a comment before we move to the next session? Oh. Please take the floor. It is partnership and uh, inclusiveness. Yes. 
No, I was, just, I was just applauding Andriana. That was it. Was a clap. <laughs> ah, it was a clap. Oh, look at this. <laughs> Sorry for misinterpretation of emojis. You see, this nonverbal communication can also be a little bit tricky. Now, friends, colleagues, uh, forum participants, you will agree with me that uh, uh, during this forum, which we have held today we have actually established, most although we already knew that air pollution and climate change are a nexus challenge and a threat to human health, the environment, and the attainment of Agenda 2063, which is the Africa we want, our NDC targets, the Paris targets, and the Agenda 2030. But more specifically for a continent like Africa that is rapidly urbanizing and uh, has got multiple development challenges like Fuso has actually highlighted to us uh, a few seconds ago. We do not have the luxury of time for in action on air pollution and climate change. Now, during this inaugural partnership forum, uh, we have shared knowledge we, and experience from, a conti from continental organizations. I mean, C4 Cities, uh, African Development Bank, uh, Stockholm Environment Institute. Uh, don't take offense if I don't mention you, you are all here, but and all of you who are on this uh, platform. We have learned a lot and uh, a number of lessons which we, I, I have captured during the conversation are that uh, we have shared experiences which will enable the team that has been working on this assessment to craft a roadmap for action to develop the Africa Clean Air Program under the leadership of the African Union. We have received commitments from leaders of part, uh, institutions and organizations that were in the partnership for the undertaking of the assessment. That is the African Union Commission, the African Ministerial Conference on Environment, Stockholm Environment Institute, Climate and Clean Air Coalition, the regional uh, UNEP regional office for Africa, all the economic communities of Africa, uh, many of the authors, co-authors, leaders, and co-chairs of the process who are on board. We have committed. Uh -oh. Kindly mute if you're not uh, Alice Kaudi at the moment. <laughs> So we, the leadership of these partners have committed to continue support towards implementation of the 37 measures across the five areas. Uh, and I do think we recall the five areas being agriculture, waste, transport, indoor air pollution, health, and, uh, and so on. We have identified gaps that have previously impeded progress in terms of uh, having clean air in Africa. And one is science policy action disconnect, whereby we find that we have high level policy decisions at the ministerial level, but we do not take them to the ground level. And they think uh, drawing lessons from Kenya SLCP with advocacy, and even also the comments by uh, Afonso that we need to ensure we reach out to the beneficiaries uh, through the safeguard mechanisms of the bank points to the need for us to close this gap. The other gap that we have identified is lack of Africa Continental Convention or air pollution or a legally binding agreement or instrument to drive systematic large scale action on air pollution. I think we have recalled the air quality agreements of 10 years ago and the historical narration of AMSEN in terms of ministerial decisions that have been taken, I think since 2012, and now we're in 2023, are uh, calling on us to think or consider having a convention on transboundary air pollution. Number three, as a gap, is that we lack, we have weak proper articulation of a case for enabling catalytic financing of investment readiness on integrated air pollution and development. And this came out from the presentation from the bank. And there was a highlight that 
we can start by ensuring that we properly articulate the case for air pollution and climate change by linking them to development benefits. For example, addressing poverty, eradicating poverty, uh, preventing biodiversity loss, uh, and also capturing a global uh, commitment, for example, on climate action and articulating it down to the ground level should be one of the things we do so that we are able to capture finance from the level of uh, uh, grants for uh, inception and uh, investment readiness and transitioning from grants to bigger pots of money through equity guarantees of risks, debt financing and other uh, financial products. We had a critique of ourselves in terms of always citing the gap of the need for capacity building, but we said we still need to uh, focus on capacity development, phrasing it in a, a way to say that where we identify a gap of knowledge, technology, we can be able to still undertake the capacity development. Finally, and that is the number five outcome, we have reaffirmed that partnerships that are integrated through trans transdisciplinary uh, community of practice are needed in Africa. And this should be based on uh, what is already in place. We can strengthen the existing communities of practice so that we are able to move forward in taking action on air pollution and climate change in an integrated manner. However, we are also reminded that creating such community uh, of practice, uh, we should be ready to peel the onion. That is, we can feel pain initially, but finally we will be very successful uh, because it is only through partnerships that we can be able to pool resources, whether financial, technology, knowledge, uh, or other enablers like policy to move forward. And as we conclude, uh, I would wish that uh, we appreciate ourselves, those of us who have been here all this time, and all your contributions that you have made so that uh, we see how we move forward. So what is the next steps? I think it's normally very good when we leave a forum like this with an understanding that we came together, we shared the knowledge, we shared the experience. So what will happen next? We are going to uh, package all the knowledge and experience that you have shared with us today into a roadmap that will support the African Union in, in terms of developing the Africa Clean Air Program. We are also going to analyze the responses that you have provided to us with regard to your specific interest on joining the community of practice and also in championing action across Africa so that we continue to be a network of scientists, policymakers, and practitioners in the field of integrated air pollution and climate change. And thirdly, this conversation will continue. This is just the inaugural uh, uh, virtual event that uh, the partners in this process have organized, but we shall be moving forward to go regional. Remember, we have the Western Africa region and we would wish to ensure that our Francophone members are with us and we are developing an inclusive uh, process for action at a very large scale in the whole continent. Thank you very much. And we now may conclude and I may declare this forum officially closed. I thank you again and I wish you well in your respective uh, actions on uh, climate change and air pollution. Thank you. Now we applaud. Thank you for the applauses. Please, you may, I don't know whether we have a photographer here. We normally photograph ourselves. If you turn on your cameras, uh, Lawrence Zuve, I see you online. Ah, great, look at these good people. Please just turn on your camera for a second and we'll capture you as having been the champions for this action across Africa 
on integrated air pollution and climate change. Just ensure that your image is in portrait, not landscape or the other way. Jerry, Godwin, Samuel, Lawrence. Lawrence, you are the action person. Are you taking the pictures already? I've taken one, Alice. Ah, you did. Uh, take across all the screens, please. If your image misses, you are missing in action. <laughs> support Africa to support yourself to enjoy clean air. There we go. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> clean air. It's now officially closed. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Thank you all for participating.